June 29th special joint study session of the Half Moon Bay Planning Commission and Architectural Advisory Committee. Um, we just have a couple of things to discuss before we officially get started with tonight's meeting. Um, this meeting is live on Comcast Local 27 and um, on Pacific Coast TV's website. We have many community members in attendance this evening um, and everyone is, um, has, will have the opportunity to, to speak this evening. Um, just a review for attendees. Um, the Planning Commission Chair will open and allow a general public comment at the beginning of the meeting, as well as open up for public comment during the specific item listed on tonight's agenda. During that time, those wanting to speak will need to be recognized by raising your hand with, with a raise hand icon. I will assist with public comment, allowing each person to speak one at a time. If you have dialed in, which I see some are on telephone, please push star six to raise and unraise your hand and star nine to mute and unmute yourself. Otherwise your computer, tablet, iPhone all have icons and features that you can press to raise your virtual hand. Um, each comment, commenter will be given three minutes of time and there will be a timer that will show up on the screen. This evening, staff emailed the Planning Commission um, some public comments that came in after the agenda was posted, but prior to tonight's meeting. Um, those were emailed and actually were currently being posted to our city's website, so you will be able to see it shortly on the agenda. Um, thank you for your patience during our remote meetings um, for this past year, and I will now hand it over to Chair Reddick to officially begin this evening's meeting. Thank you, Bridget. My pleasure to open this June 29th meeting of the Half Moon Bay Planning Commission. As Bridget said, this is a, a special joint study session with our Architectural Advisory Committee. And I'll say a few words about how it's going to work tonight, but will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance as a first step? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> uh, Bridget, if you'll please call the role of the Planning Commission and the Architectural Advisory Committee. Yes, we will start with our guest committee members this evening. Um, committee member Ponsini. I don't see her video on and then she might be having some technical difficulties. So I will, I've tried to move her over. So let's just, I'll continue and I can get her. Um, Commissioner Kikuchi. President. Commissioner, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, committee member uh, Hooker. Here. Planning Commission, um, Chair, I mean, I'm sorry, committee member Benjamin. I'm here. Commission, our committee member Gordon, Gorn, sorry. I'm just all over the place tonight. I'm here. <laughs> um, Commissioner Hernandez. I am present. Vice Chair Folgar. Here. And Chair Reddick. Here. Thank you. We will hope that Linda is able to join as promptly as possible. The, the first item of business on our agenda at this point is a planning commission review and approval of the minutes of our last meeting, which was June 8. Do any commissioners have comments on those minutes? There was just to, for the record, there was a um, misspelled error it was supposed to be aesthetically pleasing in one of the comments and it should it said aesthetically please so i will make the aesthetically pleasing um correction in the minutes thank you commissioner benjamin uh yes uh i was absent from that meeting so i will be recusing from this vote thank you thank you well, if there are no other comments from commissioners on the minutes may I, we have a motion to approve the minutes I'll move that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Vice Chair Polgar. Is there a second? Did Rick. you second, Rick? Rick did. I second. Excellent. Commissioner Benjamin is um, abstaining. Commissioner Gorn? Yes. 
Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Vice Chair Polgar? Yes. And Chair Reddick? Yes. Motion approved. Excellent. Uh, next item on our agenda is the Planning Commission welcomes public comment from members of the public at this point in every meeting. Now this is, uh, you're welcome to comment on any issue in the world other than, uh, well, I should say in the Planning Commission's purview, <laughs> other than the item that is on our agenda for a special study session tonight. So if you wish to comment on the Hyatt mm -hmm. Park, uh, the Hyatt Place Hotel project, which we will be discussing in a minute, uh, this is not the point in the agenda to do it, but any other public comments are welcome at this point. And I see none, so we will not open public comment. That brings us to our special joint study session. And um, we're pleased to welcome our Architectural Advisory Committee members joining us tonight. It's important that, the, that everybody, including the public, understand that this is a study session. It's not a decision-making meeting. No decisions will be made on this project tonight. The purpose of the study session is to inform the public, the commission and the AAC members of proposed changes to this uh, project since the last time the AAC considered it last fall. It's allow, it's, it, this study session is to allow the commission and committee members to, uh, to do a design review of the current uh, proposal, to discuss it, to give feedback uh, to, the, to the applicant and staff and especially note, please, that this is the, the, the scope of this study session is the uh, design of the, of the proposal, of the project. It is not uh, getting into all the environmental uh, issues that, um, that people may well uh, have questions and comments on. As, as the process continues and the environmental impact report for this project is completed, Later this year, the Planning Commission, of course, at that point, will hold um, uh, public hearings and welcome input from the public on, on, on the whole scope of the project. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Senior Planner Doug Garrison for presentations. Um, thank you, Chairman Roddick. Um, just a, an opening comment. Uh, our community development director, Chili, uh, has been the lead on this since before she was a community development director. And she uh, put this joint session together and unfortunately had to leave town unexpectedly today. Uh, so I will do my best uh, to muddle through this. And I um, apologize if I don't have the in-depth knowledge. She does, but we do have a good team. Um, uh, from the applicant, uh, to, I think I think we'll be fine. Uh, so, if uh, Bridget will let me share screen, I'll I just have a quick presentation. You should be able to. There you go. Um, I think Bridget has a couple of points to just go through procedurally here. Do you want to click? Oh, I was about the, you have an outline. Or, there we go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for this evening's um, meeting um, and to prepare, we did send out um, several e-news notices. Um, emails went out. There was a cancellation of the last meeting and this meeting was notified that there would be a special meeting. Um, the agenda for tonight went out to Planning Commission um, email um, interest. Hyatt has its own interest of over 320 people in the community um, and AAC. So several hundreds of people were notified um, as well as our e-news, which is several thousand um, or 13 or so hundred. Um, multiple, um, let's see, the Hyatt. So to make things easier, um, the city has created a Hyatt Hotel um, email and that's recent. Um, we found with our plan HMB and our general plan that having a separate email for 
um, bigger projects like this helps not only the community, um, but ourselves as staff to kind of keep track of all the emails coming in and, and it makes um, the applicant, um, ourselves, staff, and the public um, just a lot more organized. So it's up on the screen, uh, Hyatt Hotel at hnbcity.com. And we've also over the, it's been several years now that we've had um, a website page dedicated for the Hyatt along with any other um, bigger planning projects. Um, so the, the Hyatt um, has its own page on the website, um, has all the plans, notifications, there's, there's lots of detail that are there. So um, the city has been very um, on the forefront and transparent during this process that has been really started over you know, six plus years ago. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it back, I believe, to, uh, to Doug. Um, thanks, Bridget. Uh, from that uh, email address, uh, we did receive some comments from the public. Uh, those were forwarded to the Planning Commission this afternoon. Uh, there were, I believe, about 10 of them. Uh, they were sort of evenly divided uh, between people who were supporting this project and those who were opposed to it. Uh, the general, I think the comments could be summarized that people for it uh, liked the design. They thought it'd be good to have something like this that would anchor the south end of Main Street. It would economically support downtown businesses. Uh, the people who did not like the project uh, thought it was too big, maybe that we have too many hotels. Um, not a lot of uh, detail as far as what we're gonna talk about tonight, as far as the architectural design and the site planning, uh, but those comments are important and they are being taken into the record and um, staff will keep track of these and, and work our way through them as they accumulate. Uh, a couple of other things uh, just to clarify that are floating around. Um, there's a little bit of confusion about this project. Uh, some people think that it's connected to the Dune Surf Beach project. These are totally different projects, different landowners, different developers. Um, approval of one project does not affect whether the other project will be approved or denied, just to be clear. Uh, some people thought that uh, this was somehow in response to the recent state law uh, and funding uh, for local jurisdictions to purchase hotels and use them as housing um, uh, for formerly homeless people, that sort of thing. Um, this project has been in the hopper for half a dozen years for the Hyatt. That project, uh, the state program just went into effect last year. They're totally unrelated. Uh, and also there was, um, I think some, some people thought that the improvements to South Main Street at Highway 1 intersection uh, where somehow the city was doing that to facilitate this project. I'd like to point out that uh, the Highway 1 South improvements as well as North uh, on Highway 1, those are in the works for many years. Uh, they're done. It's a joint uh, effort with Caltrans, regional planning agencies, and the city of Half Moon Bay. And those were undertaken with or without this project. Um, I think most people know where the project is. It's a triangular piece of land right where Highway 1, Main Street, Higgins Canyon Road come together. Uh, the applicant has a little bit more detailed presentation and I'll defer to them on going through the, the site planning and the different components. Um, and I think Chairman Ruddick did a good job on this. Uh, so I'm just gonna sort of fill in a couple of pieces of information here. Um, that, that again, the focus on this is the architectural and site design. Um, city is in the process of preparing an environmental impact report. Um, once that's released, uh, there will be additional opportunities provide comments about issues like the, you know, biological resources, traffic, visual uh, resources, that sort of thing. Um, 
So one of the reasons why we brought this back is that this project has been revised a few times. The last, and this was a fairly substantial change that nobody on the AAC or the Planning Commission or the public for that matter has seen. And it just seemed a good idea to make sure everybody saw where we were on this. Um, as I said, this has been in the works since 2016. There was a study session, two of them in 2018, uh, went to the Architectural Advisory Committee in 2020. Uh, each time the project was redesigned, it started out as a, a larger project, 148 hotel rooms and an over 2,000 square foot mixed use building. Uh, today we're down to, I think it's uh, 109 rooms. Um, does include some other um, features that are important. And what we're looking at today is what we're calling the applicant's preferred alternative. And I, I don't wanna take a deep dive into CEQA, but I wanna make it clear that this didn't just drop out of the sky. It's, it's evidence that the process is working the way it's supposed to. In those previous study sessions, the scoping meeting for the EIR, we received a lot of comments about the size, the massing of the building, um, visual effects. Uh, some people thought we, we don't really need hotels, we need housing, we don't, we, we need more open space, parks. And when you're writing an environmental impact report, one of the requirements is that you have alternatives to the project that's proposed. And in this case, there, there's always under CEQA, uh, no project alternative. And then the city has broad discretion to determine the number of alternatives and what those alternatives are. And this one, uh, it's kind of unique and it is re in response to those comments. So it's a smaller hotel. Um, it includes housing now um, on the north side of Seymour Road where the car dealership currently parks cars. That area is zoned for residential currently. Um, to make it all work, the hotel is smaller the car dealership would expand a little bit into the hotel property by about a half an acre or so. And then all the cars that are currently parked on the north side of Seymour would move into a consolidated dealership area. And then the new, um, I believe it's six, up to 16 duplexes would be built over on the north side of Seymour. So it addresses some of those comments. This was not, uh, a random choice. This was in response to comments and it's, it's a solution that worked uh, for the applicant. That's why it's called the applicant's preferred alternative. Uh, as we get into the wrapping up the EIR, there will be a couple of other alternatives that we'll look at. This one um, just provided a lot of changes to way, the way the project looks works and we thought it was important to get this in front of the planning commission and the AAC. That's why we're, we're here today. Uh, I would note that the applicant is proposing to have uh, affordable housing. Uh, I believe it's uh, at least four units would be dedicated for that. Um, so the next steps as we, we go through this meeting uh, we'll gather all the comments from the commissioners and uh, committee members from the public. Uh, staff will get together, sort through those uh, if it's appropriate. We'll work with the consultants and plans may be revised to uh, accommodate some of these recommendations or comments. Uh, after that, the draft EIR will be completed and will be re released. Uh, the public circulated for comments. Uh, I believe that'll be later this summer. Um, under CEQA, there's a mandatory 45 day review period. That's the minimum. Um, somewhere in that 45 day period, we may have another study session. I'll let, by then Jill should be back and we'll work out those details. Um, and 
I do want to, I think, just follow up a little bit um, on what Chairman Ruddick said. We'll probably receive a lot of comments tonight, and we, our purpose is not to respond to all of those comments at the meeting tonight. It's really to gather those comments, and then when we have a little more time, we'll go through them and sort of figure, figure out what they all mean. Um, there may be some questions that come up where it's not clear what's on the plans, some things that need to be clarified. Um, those are, are things that we may be able to respond to tonight, and it's 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 going to be happy to. Uh, again, I don't know the project as well as Jill did, but I will do my best. And we also have um, the applicant. Uh, I believe he has his architect, landscape architect, and biologist uh, available online to um, get into some of those questions that I may not be too familiar with. Um, so that uh, concludes my presentation. I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair at this point. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, did I understand that there was to be a presentation from the applicant team at this point? Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. Well, let's proceed with that, please. And just for the record, Linda has joined us. And she is here this evening. So I just want to make that clear. Welcome, Linda. She's you're on mute, Linda, but we we got your we got your screen. So thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So we have um, the applicant and presenter. There you go. They're both in. Go ahead. Guys. Uh, good evening, everyone. Planning Commission, Architectural Advisory Committee, and everybody listening this evening. Um, it's been a long time since we've been in front of you. I guess it's been, I think it was July of 2020, we were in front of Architectural Advisory. Uh, it was the last time we had met. Um, what I want to start off with tonight is to first introduce our team. Uh, Rory O'Connell, he's with uh, Axis Architecture, and he's the lead design director. We also have Dana Riggs. Her company is Soul Ecology. She is founder and principal biologist. She specializes in freshwater and coastal ecology, wildlife biology, and environmental policy. And then also Megan Stromberg. Her company is MWS Consulting Landscape Architect. And she specializes in wetlands and habitat restoration projects, and also, also specializes in stormwater management and sustainability building technologies. So, I want to I thank Doug. He did a nice uh, lead in on the job as far as describing the project. Um, I don't have a lot to say more than that, other than the fact that, you know, we switched this plan around to support uh, trying to meet all the needs of the housing, uh, the hotel itself, which is much smaller than it was before. And then we also have two acres of open space. Um, our requirement for the site is 20% and work 40%. So the goal here was to try to get a project that's gonna work for the community. And we've worked hard to do that. I think you're gonna like the design. I know you guys have received the packet, but um, I'm gonna have Rory start this off and he can describe in detail um, the different parts of the plan. Thanks, Greg. Um... And thank you, uh, Planning Commission and uh, Architectural Advisory Committee for taking the time to review this package. And um, thank you to the public for taking the time to join this meeting and, and watch our presentation and hopefully ask questions. Um, I'm gonna share my screen if that's all right. Yes, you're, you're able to. You should Great. be able to. Okay, let me know if you can see it. Yes. Super. Okay, so this is, um, I'll try and go as quickly as possible so we have more time to, to have discussion afterward, but starting with a very quick overview of the proposed hotel project. Um, this is you know, an aerial view from the southeast. Um, everything tag and green is existing. You have the coastside uh, fire training tower there, you know, for orientation and the Ford dealership. Um, and, and 
everything tagged in blue is sort of a, a highlight of the project that we're proposing uh, for this site. So, you know, starting page left, um, introduction of a bike path and a pedestrian path um, in the setback area from the protected wetlands. Um, and as Craig said, you know, uh, a large amount of protected open space. Um, we're looking to add a, a fully site specific, energy efficient, modern, um, high place hotel, not a prototype design, but one designed specifically for Half Moon Bay, both in terms of, you know, uh, materials, scale, um, layout, everything else. Um, we're planning to incorporate solar photovoltaics to offset the energy usage from the project. Looking to include um, not just uh, bike parking for you know visitors and, and uh, staff, but also bike rentals, uh, both for guests and anybody else who would like to borrow a bike. Um, you know, separately on on the the site across Seymour, uh, I think as Greg mentioned, um, the creation of uh, new residential, um, and then you know the improvements to Main Street that come along with this project would be um, undergrounding the overhead uh, utilities. Um, installing a sidewalk, uh, there isn't really one at present. Um, the addition of EV stations, uh, both mandated current ones uh, for when the hotel hopefully opens, um, but also conduit in place to expand that in the future as, as EVs take over, as I think we, we all hope they will. Um, you know, the, 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 the placement of the main entrance uh, to the hotel site being placed opposite the Coastal Repertory Theater um, you know, mostly to preserve parking for people who live in, you know, the Main Street residential community, um, but also to create the beginnings of a relationship between the theater um, and the hotel. Um, you know, with that new sidewalk, hoping to bring in a crosswalk. Um, I, I think Greg uh, would very much like to welcome theater goers for a drink before or after or, or a coffee. Um, that, could, that relationship would be something they would be very interested in. I think would help liven up that part of the street. Um, and then lastly, you know, the the, the, the city's gone to a great effort to make this wonderful um, gateway project. And so extending the sidewalk and the pedestrian path all the way down there to sort of tie it in. Um, as far as the intended appearance uh, of the hotel project, um, we looked at examples um, that take a sort of agricultural industrial vernacular, um, what some might call far most modern. And we looked at um, you know, some very traditional ways of doing that. So this stuff over the left and some very contemporary, maybe too edgy stuff like you're on the right. And we aim to get somewhere in the middle looking at things like Sea Ranch, like some of the you know, higher end homes uh, along the coast along the Rio Highway. Um, and I think just reiterating uh, Greg's point from earlier, you know, it's, it's a very long site, you know, almost 900 feet long. Um, and the design as proposed leaves almost half of the site's length vacant. So it's to maximize those views through and minimize the impact of the proposed hotel. Again, I'll try and be quick here, but the, the basic proposal is a, uh, a two building split, a three story north building and a two story south building with a, an angle um, and a, a gap in between with the glazed connection of the ground floor only, not at the second floor. And again, just highlighting that that main entrance office of the theater, um, really only a very small, you know, curb cut at the north end to accommodate um, service vehicles, uh, but not intended to be a, a major driver of traffic. I think our landscape architect was going to say a few words on this slide. Is that right? Nice. Great. That's Megan. I'll bring her in. Okay, and I think Dana was also going to speak, but I, I'm, um, maybe I will just give her. She's on her way in, so. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'll go ahead and say what I was going to say. I was gonna talk about the plant selection. So there's a buffer area between the wetlands and the building. 
And um, this buffer area will be primarily planted with regionally native plants selected appropriate for the climate and for low water use, um, and also to enhance the wildlife and pollinator habitat that's, um, that's already there. So they would include coastal sage scrub species like ceanothus, monkey flower, buckwheat, and sage. Um, and then the bioretention areas, which will um, be receiving all the runoff from the impervious areas of the project, the roof and the parking area and the pathways, um, will be located in the buffer between the bike path and the walking path. And they would also be planted with primarily native species that are adapted to the bioretention. So that has a very fast infiltration rate, um, and but is also seasonally flooded during the rainy season. And I think Dana wanted to say a few other things if she's able to join. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was. I think I was on mute, <laughs> talking away. Um, thank you, Megan. Uh, yeah. So the the landscape plan goal, the the number one goal, is to protect and preserve the open space grassland habitat um, that is located to the west of the site. Um, and that includes the wetlands and the 100 foot buffer zone around the wetlands. Um, and as Megan was describing, so there's the bike path um, that's located um, next to the wetlands. That is, um, that was placed um, on the property to avoid, placed on the outside of the Caltrans right away on the property to avoid impacts to wetlands located partially in the Caltrans right away. So the original plan was to direct that bike path through those wetlands and so to minimize those impacts. Greg has taken on the bike path and brought that onto the property and incorporated it with the landscape design. Um, due to the proximity of the wetlands to the Caltrans right away, enhancement of this area is, is still under analysis. So I, I don't have any details on that. Um, but the, um, the bike path is set back 25 feet from those wetlands and then we have an additional 75 feet until the next, until the walking path. And then the walking path will serve as an additional buffer between the Hyatt from the hotel and the wetlands and that buffer zone there. Um, the, the walking path um, will have a split rail fence to further protect that buffer zone so that folks walking on the path can't just go into the buffer area. And then the bike path will also have um, either bollards or um, or maybe I, have that, I may have that backwards, sorry. I think the bike path will have the split rail and the walking path will have the bollards so that you don't have bikes deviating off the path. Um, trees will be placed around the outside of the buffer zone, outside the buffer zone to protect that native grassland habitat. That's really important from a biological standpoint. We don't really have a lot of trees in the coastal zone that are native, so any trees, there was a comment, there wanted more trees on the site, all of those trees will be placed outside the buffer zone around the buildings to provide um, shade and screening. And then also um, trees, as, I'm sorry, trees as well as hedges or decorative fencing will be used to screen um, other parts of the property such as the dealership, um, the frontage roads and, um, and the um, parking lot to protect um, to prevent light from entering the, the nearby residence, residential area. And then um, hedge, if a hedge, if a hedge is used, we're looking at using a hedge specifically next to the parking area in order to really minimize um, light infiltration into the nearby residential areas and also to provide habitat. That Those hedge species will be um, reviewed by myself uh, to make sure that they are compatible and not invasive um, to the surrounding area. Um, and then I, I know there's a plan to use uh, gray water from the hotel laundry to support the upland landscape areas outside of the buffer zone. Um, and that's it. And then let all of Megan's input on the um, species. Again, all the species are native to the surrounding community and compatible with the um, ecological values of that area of the buffer zone and the wetlands. And that's all I have. You can go to the next slide. Rory. 
just jumping back in quickly, um, uh, floor plans of the proposed hotel. Um, I understand these are available at, at City Hall if you want to spend more time with them, but the basic split is that the, the North Building houses mostly guest rooms with some laundry at the ground floor, um, whereas the South Building uh, hosts the meeting spaces, the lobby, um, patio dining, um, small bar, uh, and a fitness room for guests to use. Um, and again, we can see that that split between the buildings here um, with a sort of angled breezeway between. Um, second floor, not terribly exciting, but wanted to point out that we did uh, manage to push the uh, north wall of the south building uh, further back to again maximize that, that opening between the buildings. And then third floor of the north building, we'll show you this in the elevations and perspectives, but our approach here really was to try and uh, diminish the bulk of the third floor by setting it back from the second and by creating gaps between guest rooms where possible. Um, so we'll show you how that looks, but that's that's what we what's what you're seeing uh, later on. So on to elevations. Um, really wanted to have a, a consistent language um, of pitched roofs um, and vernacular siding. Um, recognizing this building, you know, behind the landscaping um, doesn't have a back. There's no backside where you can have a you know a, a, um, a less finished exposure. And so facing Main Street, facing the Rio Highway. Um, facing the gateway, want to have a consistent quality uh, for all sides, um, and we're going to have a consistent language. Um, trying to have a, a, a darker, more neutral color palette with um, pops of uh, more natural material uh, at selected areas of more interest, um, and generally emphasizing that sort of low horizontal, um, not quite barn, uh, not quite um, industrial agriculture building, but, but a nod towards it. And then coming around toward the, the north building, uh, this is closer to the Ford dealership. Um, continuing that same language, but with that third floor in place, um, you can sort of see in this elevation where we have sort of the, the primary visible pitch and then a second pitch for these guest rooms and then breaks between them uh, to again reduce the apparent bulk of an along the line of, of guest rooms. I want to touch briefly on the sections. Um, we're uh, constrained by the existing grade, not the uh, after grading uh, grade, as far as I understand it. And so this is demonstrating how we uh, aim to stay below that height restriction. Um, and also just, you know, show how far the proposed hotel is from, you know, the property line from Main Street with the Rio Highway relative to the height. You know, we have a hundred foot from the wetlands here, um, you know, which is occupied with, you know, the landscaping that, uh, um, my, my colleagues mentioned, um, and then towards Main Street as well, potential for hedge, you know, new sidewalk, um, planting in the parking area. So the building isn't, you know, pressed up to the street like a more urban condition might be. Um, the material palette, I'm trying to keep it very simple um, and very consistent. So uh, we're looking at um, board and batten and siding, um, most likely in a fiber cement, which has a higher initial embodied energy than uh, a wood product, but lasts far longer, requires less maintenance, and I think is, is more sustainable as a result. Um, looking at using real wood, perhaps in a couple of areas to really um, make those uh, you know, feel more special, particularly up close and personal. Um, standing seam or corrugated metal roofing, um, which is again, very durable, very consistent with that aesthetic. Um, dark metal windows, or from concrete at the base where we're, you know, this building meets the ground. Um, and looking at uh, engineer's stone or center stone panels um, on some of the uh, elevator towers in particular. And so just a quick preview of sort of, we're gonna show you some perspectives. Um, and this is uh, what those perspectives are showing material wise. Not quite photo real, but this is this sort of uh, a study of how it should look. So um, a lot of the building is, is Board and batten, you know, one of those two or three tones we're going to use. Um, and again, just that language of, of overhanging um, pitched roofs and simple volumes and relatively subtle signage. So with that, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of perspective views. Just got a couple here and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. This is uh, the proposed view from the Cabrillo Highway. Um, you can see sort of the, the height difference between the north building and the south building. You can see that gap between the buildings uh, with that breezeway. 
um, you know, we're, we're showing this landscape as, as sort of grass for the time being, uh, and then we develop the landscape as we develop the project. Um, coming in a little bit closer, this is that, that walking path coming close to the building, and you can see the impact of these balconies and patios uh, facing out towards the Brio and towards the, towards the water. Uh, I do want to point out we're proposing integrated solar um, on these roofs. Uh, we haven't sized that yet with, uh, with the solar vendors, but we think it should offset a fairly substantial percentage of the building's energy usage. Um, coming closer, just highlighting that breeze, connect, breezeway connector again um, and fitness rooms uh, for guest use facing out. And where we have these, these pop-ups, that's where we have a, an elevator tower and just uh, integrating that mass into the building, kind of echoing a um, uh, fireplace chimney kind of appearance. Getting a little bit closer, we can see now um, those gaps between the guest rooms. Uh, idea for enclosing the patio that you know feels a little bit private, but also isn't um, too intimidating for folks you know jogging by. At the uh, the south end, facing the Gateway Project, um, and you know sort of visible at a distance uh, from the major roadway. This is where we have our sort of public spaces of, of the hotel. Um, we have a dining area and bar over here in this overhang. Um, outdoor patio space. Uh, I, I know the climate in Aspen Bay isn't always the warmest and uh, least windy, and so trying to create a, a place you might actually want to sit outside, maybe in front of an outdoor fire and have a coffee. Um, I'm sure, again, Greg, we, we welcome you all to stop by for that. Um, just want to point out the, the intent of this, this stair is that it's open to the lobby. So not only do you have views as soon as you walk in through the building and out and from across the street through the building, but also the idea that people might actually use the stairs to go to their guest room on the second floor. And you know, you'll see activity telegraphing the face of the building. Um, coming back around toward that port crochet, um, you know, bike racks, you know, a little bit of, of um, uh, screening of that um, outdoor area from Main Street. So that, you know, you're, you're aware there's activity there, but it's not, you know, right in front of you. Um, you know, building entrance in Port Cachere and kind of put a canopy out there, which, you know, allows you to park and let somebody out and not get rained on and um, create a welcoming environment. A little more detail here, um, proposing a monument sign um, out of the new sidewalk and then um, appropriate planting and trees, both in the parking area and, and along Main Street. And then lastly, if you view that canopy and the, uh, the drop off. So that was, that was a lot to go through in a short space of time. So um, we welcome your questions and, and thanks again for uh, taking the time. Well, thank you. Thanks to Greg and the entire team. I think at this point in the process, we will invite clarifying questions from commissioners and committee members. As a reminder, please restrict these to factual, simple, factual questions to uh, staff or the applicants team. Uh, we have 27 attendees. And so we want to get to public hearing as quickly as possible. Uh, and for your for going forward tonight, if you'll please direct your questions through the chair to staff, we'll let we'll let Doug uh, uh, sort them out from there. Commissioner Hernandez. Hello, thank you for the great presentation. Um, while I do have clarifying questions, um, I will, since this is the first time I'm speaking, I will mention that I've had ex parte communications with the applicant um, multiple times over the years, which I've also reported. I've also had a communication with Mr. Jamison in the last three months on this project. So I just wanna make sure that that's in the public record. Um, when, when I look at this project, and uh, this is a clarifying question. So when I look at this project and I hear that the number one uh, incentive or idea is to protect and preserve the wetlands, and I don't see a clear plan out of the gate uh, in, in what was provided to us, it, it's a little concerning. Um, and, and I was pleased to hear some of the things that you said. But when you think about this project, and this is really more for the city than for the applicant, can you talk about two things? One, 
the status of the, this property because it looks like a used to be a farmland has been neglected and now gets mowed all the time and it's it's still a wetland but it's not a great wetland so can you talk about the status of the current um part of the project it's a wetland and clarify like you know in your opinion what is this going to do to improve to to address the wetland is it going to make it worse is it going to make it better is this a fundamental rehabilitation of what used to be a wetland what used to be part of the coastal prairie um is this something that is going to you know take it back to what it was before people started farming the land um and then the second question is could you just clarify when we started this process i think your first slide said 140 this was like it's going to be 148 rooms or something like that. So we, we've gone down by about one third in the, can you just clarify where we've gone from the original point to now, not just from the last iteration of this, because I, I think the majority of the time of my six years, we've been talking about this project. So there's a lot of things we've covered and a lot of feedback we've provided. So could you just talk about where the original proposal started and where we've gotten to now. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Uh, Mr. Garrison, do you want to respond to some or all of that? Uh, yeah, I can respond to that. Um, I think on the wetlands, um, one thing to keep in mind is that the reason why they're there is because of Highway 1, largely. Um, it's elevated above the site, and so water runs off the road and collects along the, the low-lying area there. Um, the project itself, as I understand it, construction of the hotel, will not adversely affect those wetlands as they exist today. Um, that's being addressed in detail in the environmental impact report. My understanding of the design is that it does not adversely affect those wetlands, does not fill them in with sediment and that sort of thing, but it um, will per is intended to improve what's there as far as wetland quality with some careful planting of native plants as opposed to a lot of the non-native weeds that grow there now. Um, also, as, as the applicant mentioned, they will be diverting um, some of their stormwater runoff, the cleaner water out into that area and with some careful design and quality control, that water could enhance um, the quality of the wetlands. Um, but that will be addressed in greater depth in the environmental impact report than I can cover today. Um, as far as the farmlands, that sort of thing, this was a farm, uh, has not been actively farmed in quite some time. Uh, in the EIR, there is an evaluation uh, of the potential effects on uh, viable farmland, the types of soils that could be um, considered prime soils. Uh, there is a feasibility analysis process that you go through. Um, it's, it's laid out in our local policy documents as well as under CEQA. And that exercise has been included in the draft EIR as I understand it, but it's been a while since I was involved in that conversation, but it will be addressed in a, an in-depth way in the EIR. Um, as far as the, the progression of the project, um, 2016, before I was with the city, it was 149 rooms. It had uh, another like 2,500 square foot building which would have sort of served multi uses. I don't know the details. Um, kind of in the next round, it went from 149 down to 129 rooms. Uh, 
was sort of broken up into different configuration as far as multiple rooms, uh, um, buildings instead of one large one. Um, and now we're down to 109 rooms, as I understand it. So it's, it's gone down, uh, yeah, by about 30 rooms. Um, covers substantially less square footage, at least the hotel part. Uh, I think it's gone from around 90,000 square feet down to, it's in the staff report, but I think 60,000 or so. It's, it's a substantial reduction. Um, now with this design, like you said, the alternative we're looking at, which includes um, some new features, shifting part of the auto dealership into this property, I think about a half acre or so, which is facilitated because it's a smaller hotel project now, there's room to do that. Once they do that, they can move the cars from the other side of Seymour onto the car dealership so they're in one location. That frees up the land on the other side, which is zoned for residential. It frankly could be developed uh, with duplexes today with just a coastal development permit. Um, and so to the, product, the hotel part has gone down a lot over the years. Adding in these other features, we're, we're kind of talking about apples and oranges, but this alternative will be fully evaluated in the IR. One of the things you're required to do is determine, does this alternative reduce certain impacts? Does it cause new impacts that you weren't anticipating or make other impacts worse? And all of that will be fleshed out in, in detail in the EIR. Uh, I think that addresses your questions. No, I think that was a very good, um, very good response to the questions I put forth. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the rest of my colleagues who are here and see who else has a clarifying question. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin, do you have a clarifying question? Uh, I think so. Uh, I know you'll help me if I'm straying too far away. So thank you. And um, good evening, colleagues. Nice to be back. It's great to see Linda and Steve and Chad um, back in the back in the team here. Um, so, and I'm really interested in hearing more about their their thoughts. I thought they had some very wise remarks on some of the earlier iterations. So. I'm going to try to hold back a lot until I get to hear more of what they're thinking. But I did want to pick up a couple of themes um, uh, with respect to what they said. I'll be really interested in whether the uh, space between the buildings uh, achieves the design goals that they uh, suggested might be desirable for the project. So I'll be hoping to hear about that. Um, the location of the uh, the path, uh, both the bicycle path and the footpath has a sort of public private ambiguity to it. Um, and I'm trying to get clarity in my mind about uh, uh, the intent. And, uh, you know, if we're facilitating coastal access through these, through these paths, um, is that also true, for example, with the proposed charging stations? Is this really a convenience facility uh, exclusively for the guests or do we envision um, as the trails are designed to accommodate guests and non-guests alike that this is a place where uh, as sort of a vision for coastal access this might be part of the uh, the grand shift uh, accelerating the grand shift to uh, electric vehicles um, is there a thought at this stage in the design about that? Is, maybe there's already clarity on that, and I'm just missing. Thanks, Commissioner Benjamin. Um, in the interest of serving our priority of getting public comment on this, I'm going to suggest that we not ask staff to respond to these clarifying questions one by one, but gather them up, think about them, and, and so we can get to public hearing as quickly as possible. No, that's that's perfect. So I'll just put so categorize my question as the public private space ambiguity department and <laughs> see if we can get uh, clarity about what the uh, intention is. We've got the gap question I asked earlier. 
Um, and we have the uh, another area, which is the integration with the town boulevard concept. Um, I know that that's still being developed, but uh, to the extent that they're sort of uh, code development, I think it'll be interesting to think about how um, those should work. I think I'll uh, I'll back away. You know, I have other more specific things that might be worth talking about, but those are sort of open ended. And if they were easy clarifications, it would be great to get them. And if there aren't, at least they're they're flagged. Thank you for that, Commissioner Gorn. Hey there. Um, so. Clarifying question, something I don't understand. Staying away from the EIR <coughs> stuff. Um, where does the bike path go? That's my question. Okay, a good question. You get, on, you get on this, you know, you rent your bike, you get on the bike path, and where are you going? I don't <laughs> understand. Good. Well, we'll we'll look forward to staff shading light on that. Um, I had one, I'd, I'd appreciate it, uh, Doug, when we when we get to it, if you could uh, just show me once more the, um, for the property north of Seymour, the, I was a little confused by the number of lots and the number of units. So if we could revisit that, but uh, seeing no more requests for clarifying questions, I'm gonna open the public hearing. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Polder. Sorry, my box keeps moving around. Um, I just one clarifying question, just to confirm what's happening in the about half acre that will now where that will now be part of the um, the dealership. If that's all parking or a little more specificity on that, because it was a I, I it just at this point didn't um, wasn't quite clear to me what was happening in that space. Um, that's all. Good deal. I do see uh, AAC member Mr. Hooker has a has his hand up. Yes, I, I think the uh, clarifying questions I have are more details that would go to the architect. I'm I noticed on the ground floor of the north north building on the main street side, there's a kind of a service and industrial section of the building that has a laundry and uh, employee uh, space and and some other things. I'm wondering. If there's some special glazing going on in there, if that'll just all be the standard clear windows that are everywhere else, which could look a little odd there. I'm also very curious about the location of the uh, bike shop in the proximity of the bike path. It seems like if you came out of that shop with a bike, you couldn't get to the bike path. And I'm wondering, uh, there's, there's a relatively narrow space between the north end of the north building and whatever that uh, fence line is from there to the Ford dealership, if that's a path through there, could be or should be, or if the buildings need to move a few feet to the south to create a space there so that you could get from bike shop to the bike path without, I don't know, riding across the pedestrian paths, I guess, around public sidewalks. And I'm curious what the what kind of demising line there is there between the uh, 6,100 of an acre that's added to the Ford dealership and the hotel property. If that's a, a fence, there was some brief comment about that, I think from the landscape architect. And I'm, I'm assuming it's not a low split rail fence or something, but that there would be some separation there. Also, I'd, I'm curious about the, uh, I guess I would say the color palette. When I look at the uh, renderings, now it's less the renderings actually than the elevation that shows the, the main street side of the buildings. They look very, very dark. And I'm wondering if there's any better clarification of what, uh, what the breakdown of that palette there is. Light colors, medium colors, and dark colors, but the renderings make the building look very dark. And I'm curious exactly what the, what the plan is in there. Um, And I'm also a bit curious about what the vertical columns are that surround the building. There's some under the port cochere and then uh, adjacent to the patio at the south end and at the various balconies along the west side. And I'm wondering what that material is, if those are round steel columns or something else, something perhaps more rustic or if they've got that kind of more industrial look that you're, you're echoing in a few of the other design elements. Um, I've got some other kind of finer points to get into, but 
in the interest of getting to the public hearing. That's, but those, those are my questions in there for the architect team. Thank, thank you, Chad. Yes. Uh, committee member Kikuchi. Uh, yes, this may be a question more for staff. And um, I'm just wondering if the signage program is part, will, will be and is part of this entire process. Uh, and if the signage that we're seeing presently right now is indicative of what might be occurring in the future. And I, I think key to that is how, how the signage is actually illuminated. So to me, that's very critical being in that southern section of, of town. Um, and I think the other thing, the other question I wasn't clear on when the architect gave the presentation, he mentioned solar on the uh, northern building roof, but I wasn't sure if that also was gonna occur on the, the southern building as well. And those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, committee member Ponsini. You're on mute, Linda. There we go. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Thanks. Good, right. Thank you. Um, so I have sort of a, a bigger picture question um, that first uh, that we've seen or heard of these duplexes that might be occurring. And uh, there is no design information on those at all, uh, other than there was a uh, partial um, uh, installation of the um, visuals on the site, but it doesn't really give us a good a good idea of the location, the massing, uh, anything about the design. So I I think that's something that we would that's something I would really want to know a lot more about, especially if this is tied to this project and if it's part of this review and this approval, uh, we would have to have as much detailed information about those as we do about the uh, hotel itself. So uh, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jameson, I see you have your hand up, but if, if it's to respond to any of these clarifying questions, may I please ask you to hold that for, for staff responses? Yeah. You nod your head, yes? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I'm I'm prepared to open the public hearing unless there are reasons not to. Okay, we'll open the public hearing. Bridget, please uh, manage the logistics of that with your okay. usual skill. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have, um, so anyone who would like to speak um, please go ahead and raise your hand. I do have one um, that is a video um, voiceover for Pat uh, Cimenti and her husband, Larry, both wanted to speak this evening and they um, emailed earlier to allow Larry to um, give up his actual speaking time to Pat to do this uh, video. Um, so I'm going to just give me a moment to pull this video on the share here. Um, and I will, so it'll be a six minute video, just let you know. Just wanted to get it over first thing. All right. Technology here, just one second. Just give me one. I have lots of things open, so just um, I apologize for the uh, delay here for just one second. No worries. We appreciate your managing this for for the whole process. All right, let's see if I can share it. It takes up my whole. Okay. Let me see if I can pull this off. Okay. 
Okay, can you guys all, can you see that? Yes, okay. indeed. Here we go. If there's audio, I'm not hearing it. Are you not hearing it? Is no one hearing yeah, no. it? I'm not hearing it either. No audio. Not hearing it. No, I can't hear anything. Um, Bridget, just, just to save us all from the technical difficulties that are gonna come here. And I know like we've got five minutes left. Can we just have the um, the person who put this presentation together just provide a voiceover? Because uh, otherwise we're gonna be here for 15 minutes trying to watch this. Correct, um, apologize it wasn't working. I, I tried it earlier, but yeah, I will allow them to talk. This is Pat. Can you play the video again? It's not sharing. Hello, hello, this is Pat Shemeni. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see the video now, Bridget. Can you play it? I could read along with it, but I, I I had it all coordinated. So if I read too fast and done out of sync, I apologize for that, but I'll read at a reasonable price. Oh, where'd my thing go? Where'd it go? Okay. Hold on, I, I'm sorry. It's, it, I tried it earlier and it was working for me, but... Um... I didn't do anything to it so I no 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 I know it's it, I, I uploaded it so I could do it quicker on here but if, I apologize um should I just play the video on my thing would that work yeah probably probably um just let me just see if it will I'm just gonna do one little thing I'm gonna move you to a panelist and see if you can just do it yourself yeah. we'll try it one more time and then we'll let it go okay Larry Larry you're on the screen Okay, so now you're on and you should be able to share your screen and you can probably play it. Okay, Ashley, get it to me. My daughter's going to help us. Okay, I'm moving. Okay, hon. I can, um, yeah. It doesn't, go ahead. Should I sit? Yeah. Okay, hold uh, on. Just go back to the beginning. Just yep. Hello, my name is Pat Schumann, and I have lived in Half Moon Bay since 1989. The land my house is located on was purchased back in 1984. It took five long years to build my home. The city of Half Moon Bay at the time only allowed one builder, J. L. Johnson, to construct houses in the Miramani's tract. He turned out to be a crook. <laughs> Several years ago, I learned of the Wave Crest project. It was advertised as a new middle school to replace the old Acuna School located on Kelly Avenue in Half Moon Bay. Seems the school was only part of a big industrial park that would house large retail outlet like Walmart. Can you imagine what would have happened to Main Street if this project was approved by the city council? I am so glad that many neighbors, including me, stood up and complained and finally got the project stopped. And now it seems another developers group, the RGJC South LLC, which is part of the James Ford dealership in Half Moon Bay, is trying to get a motel built on the narrow strip of land at the southernmost end of Main Street, right across from the open Wavecrest fields. Back in June 24, 2000, a Half Moon Bay gateway sculpture by Sharon Mayers was erected to draw the eye to the entrance of the downtown Half Moon Bay, where the Wavecrest View Corridor was protected and open, where the trees lined streets and the lower income 
housing was inviting. Now the city is putting in another intersection light at the entrance of Main Street from Highway 1. I was told by the city that it is not related to the Hyatt project, but an intersection light is one thing. A large decorative cement wall and dirt piles on either side of Main Street's entrance tells me otherwise. It looks like a lead in to a new housing development. The Half Moon Bay Gateway sculpture is hidden behind the northern cement blockade. Why do I have a feeling that this project will become the first victim of the Hyatt project? The second victim are the homes along the end stretch of Main Street. They will lose the view corridor to the Pacific Ocean through the web wave crest open fields. What they will see from their homes will be a parking lot and the back wall of Long Motel with parked cars, waste bins, and lights to keep the parking lit at night. They will also never see another sunset over the Pacific. Does HNB really need another hotel? I got on my phone and Googled hotels, motels near HMB. I got 15. I put the information sites picks for each. I noticed that some had discounted prices because of the pandemic. Motels have not been open for customers. I also know that when the sun shines on the weekend, HMB fills up with tourists. But realize this, the majority of tourists do not stay overnight, unless of course it is during the pumpkin festival weekend. Yeah one weekend a year. Half Moon Bay does not need another motel. The last two hotels I listed are San Benito House, which was built around 1910. It was just renovated when it had an unexpected fire. It will take a year to fix. The Holiday Inn Express could not make it in Half Moon Bay. It was renamed the Coast Cider, and that too now is defunct. The pandemic is the reason the city turned it into a temporary homeless shelter. <laughs> On another note, this Hyatt project is located really close to the fire department. These dedicated individuals are always training and preparing for whatever emergency comes their way. And with this very dry weather in California now, it is most likely will cause the following to disrupt any Hyatt guests. <laughs> Truth is, Half Moon Bay doesn't need another motel hotel. This Hyatt project to me shows as a lead-in project for another big development that just happens to also be a part of the Faceless LLC doing the Hyatt. That project concerns the unsold car lot across Seymour Street from the original James Ford dealership. On that lot is one story pole erected next to the unsold cars. This lot was an extension to the dealership approved by the city back in 1998. Back then, there was a concern about the lot flooding by the other occupant of that area whose house had experienced it during large downpours. There was also concern about the ugly look of a parking lot and planting of trees and covers that was discussed to hide the lot. But the parking lot was approved even though there was much negative debate against it. Commissioner Don Hines said of the extension, park cars don't cause noise and aren't bad neighbors. But now it is projected to become duplexes. Is the LLC trying to pull profit from their two land purchases? The one story pole is misleading. There should be eight story poles erected on the lot to show an actual impact of the duplex development of 16 to 24 units. These duplexes are not low income housing units. However, there are a few four to six units designated as affordable. Affordable to whom? The first buyer possibly, but those could be resold for any price. This duplex community will be very tight, crowded, and will require parking lots and lighting, and will increase the population of that already close and tight neighborhood. Allowing this Hyatt Hotel is just the start. Stop the Hyatt Hotel project and stop the duplex project. They are both bad ideas for Half Moon Bay. I just want to thank you for allowing me to express my opinion on the subject. And I do hope Half Moon Bay considers the past 
when dealing with the future. You know, the, the Planning Commission bends over backwards to facilitate public comment on public issues. I would ask members of the public going forward from this, bear in mind that this is a study session about the design and, uh, and architecture of the project. And uh, please confine your, your comments to that as much as possible. Ooh. Do we have other speakers, Bridget? Um, I'm not seeing any. There's no hands being raised this evening. <clears throat> well, for uh, for you folks in attendance, this is the the point in the meeting to um, make yourself heard. We welcome your your comments on this on the study session. Oh, one, one. Oh, there we, go. we have one, um, Stephanie and Steve Dyers. Um, my, I'm, I'm keeping time offline here. My connected timer on the Zoom call is not connecting, even though it says it is. So um, I will be keeping track of, of the three minutes. Thank you, Bridget. Welcome, Steve and Stephanie. Go ahead, you can speak. Thank Go you. Um, I have a concern uh, as far as um, wildland fire and evacuation and the ability for first responders to respond to a natural disaster in Half Moon Bay. And as you know, um, the challenge we have with uh, traffic is 92 and one are parking lot many times of the day and on weekends and holidays. So um, should we have a natural disaster? Um, how are we gonna deal with that? And the other question I have is on our water. We're in the, in the start of a, not in the start, but we're in the middle of a drought. Do we have enough water in Half Moon Bay to serve the residents of Half Moon Bay and the 3 million guests that we get every year? And any other additions that are added? So my question is, um, to me, this doesn't seem like very good planning. If we don't have water, you can't do anything without water. And if there's a major natural disaster, how are we gonna evacuate all the people that are already coming here and the residents? And why, why do we wanna add, add to that? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your comments. I, I guess I'll, I'll repeat myself that um, this is a pretty narrow focus tonight with this study session on the architectural design of the, of the project. So there will come a time in the process when, uh, when uh, concerns about regional water supply and such are very germane, but um, with respect, it isn't really tonight. So I'd encourage attendees who wish to comment as part of this uh, hearing to do so now. Once we close the public hearing, uh, we, won't, uh, we won't reopen it again tonight. I see none. I'm a bit surprised there are so many attendees and so few speakers, but oh. say la vie. I have... Um... Chris Beckman. Welcome, Chris. Yeah, hi, thank you for taking my comment, my question. Um, trying to fit this into the appropriate <laughs> words. Uh, driving down the highway after the, uh, I don't know what you call those things, the orange 
uh, indicators of how tall the building is going to be. Story poles. Story poles, thank you. Um, I was taken with how from if that is built as is, as that tall, then uh, going forward, the view of the hills will, will be gone. Um, I think it's a, a lovely design and as far as uh, designs for hotels go. I, 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 I compliment the architects, but um, not really seeing the need for another 102 hotel rooms. And um, we have other needs in Half Moon Bay, but as you said, this isn't the appropriate uh, time for that type of comment. Um, I guess as far as the design goes, it, it did seem rather high as far as uh, obscuring the view of the, of the hills. And um, there was one other thing, but I, it has slipped my mind now. But thank you for taking my comment slash question. Thank you for making it. Next, we have um, Paul McGregor. Welcome, Paul. Good evening, everyone. I want to uh, commend the Jameson team for uh, taking down the size of the buildings and uh, lowering the amount of units and actually reducing the footprint significantly. Uh, the color palette that I see on the buildings actually is uh, very refreshing. It looks really good. I think they've done a really good job on this. They've incorporated a lot of different um, materials and they've, they've uh, articulated, articulated the buildings well. And I, I like the thought of the way the bike path runs through and the protection of the wetlands. As far as the duplexes go, um, Half Moon Bay desperately needs more housing. And I, I would think it would be a good point to have that on Seymour right there and keep it in the residential zoning that is already there, that's already established. And again, I think the uh, project looks great. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Well, I'm seeing Charlotte, I, I see no one else. Well, we won't rush to close the public hearing because we wanna make sure that everybody, even if you're a little shy, gets a chance to have your voice heard. This would be the right time to raise your hand if you want to make any comments. No? Going once, going twice. Oh. <laughs> Just in time. You're good at this. Uh, Fran, and I'm going to mess with the last name. I just, I could, you, she can say we have Fran. Welcome, Fran. There you are. Yep. I um I want to uh, agree with I think it's or bring up the point of the, the bicycle path. I don't get it. Uh, where's it going to? Where's it going from? What the actual trail is on the other side of the road. I don't understand what this short little bicycle path is. And the second thing is, I don't understand how you can accept the plan without knowing what the duplexes look like. Or are, am I wrong? Are they separate projects and they have nothing to do with each other? Or so that's my question. I don't understand this duplexes. I don't think I saw the plan for them or pictures of them. And again, that bicycle path still bothers me. I kind of going to nowhere. Maybe even encouraging people to cross without the light. I don't know. That's so that's what I have to say. Okay, interesting questions. I'm sure that staff will answer both of those for you. Thank you. We, we welcome anyone else who would like to comment at this point. Uh, through the chair, um, for people yes. who are listening in rather than um, video, 
wasn't there a star six or something? Did that come up in the earlier conversation for raising your hand or is that now passe? No. Bridget it, did it, mention it, that. It is, yeah. Um, it's to raise an unrated is star six. And there's we do have a couple people on on phone. Well, again, I'll encourage anyone who wants to make a comment to do so at this point. Well, seeing, seeing no further requests to comment, I close the public hearing. And the next order of business will be to go to deliberations by AAC members and the commission. Is everyone okay with doing that now, as opposed to taking a break? Through the chair. Commissioner um, Hernandez. There were clarifying questions that um, this body put forth. Do you wanna answer those questions first and then take a break? That, that's a very good idea, Rick. Thank you for that. If uh, Doug, if uh, staff is prepared to do that, that would make sense. Uh, yeah, I, I am. Can I add one more clarifying question before we do that? Sure. Okay. Um, I looked at the 2014 economic and real estate conditions report. Uh, it indicated that there, at that point in time, in 2012, there were 3.8 million visitors to Half Moon Bay annually. I wonder if the city has an updated version certainly feels like a lot more people are coming over here since then. Certainly uh, in the COVID <laughs> environment we're, oh, we've been in, we've had a lot more folks coming. So uh, I wonder if you have more current information on that. Um, I, uh, what I'm gonna recommend is that, uh, I'll take a stab at going through all the clarifying questions um, some of them, I think, um, are going to get a little bit in the weeds and, and are more for the architect and the applicant. So maybe I'll take a stab at the ones that staff can address, and then we can decide um, if you want to jump into clarifying questions with the applicants and the consultants or sort of how to approach that, maybe break it down into a couple of chunks. Sounds good. Um, I think uh, with, with uh, Commissioner Hernandez's questions uh, I did respond to, uh, I hope that's uh, been dealt with adequately. Uh, if not, we can get the biologists involved and get a little more info about the wetlands and that sort of thing. I, 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 think, I think you've responded well. Um, to those questions. And uh, I think, you know, we have a responsibility to read the actual EIC documents when they come forth. So <laughs> we're not going to torture everybody with that now. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Benjamin's uh, comments, uh, I think those are probably more appropriate for the architect and the applicant to get into as far as how the bicycle and footpaths work together and is it public is it private uh i'm just not that i haven't been that deeply involved with the project so i don't want to try and respond on that one um uh, commissioner corn's question and also came up later about where does the bike path lead to uh i do know a little bit about this um the city does have plans for an east side bike path. Uh, it's addressed in a bicycle and pedestrian plan. And these things tend to proceed kind of in bits and pieces. Uh, we are uh, moving forward with uh, a class one bike path that goes from the north side of Main Street up Highway 1 that eventually will connect all the way up to the San Mateo County line. Uh, different pieces of it are either in the process of being permitted or they're approved and in design and getting funding. A lot of that relies on outside grant funding, so city doesn't have total control over those. 
Um, I will say I did get uh, a notice from Caltrans recently that was not specific to Half Moon Day, but it was about their sort of planning efforts for Highway 1 Coast Side. Uh, one of the things they mentioned, it's, it's mostly traffic signal improvements and repaving, but they also noted they uh, wanted to build a new bike path on the east side of Highway 1 from uh, Main Street down to Kelly Avenue. Uh, I haven't seen any plans for it. I don't know who's paying for it, but the goal is that eventually these pieces of bike paths will all connect together and we'll have basically continuous um, coverage uh, for, for quite some distance. Uh, and a lot of that is laid out, like I said, in the bike and pedestrian plan. If people want to take a little bit deeper dive, there's, I recommend they take a look at that. Um, can, uh, I ask, can I just get, so these are clarify, it's a clarifying question. So I'm just trying to understand. I, I assume that it would hook up to the east, you know, the, the east bike path they're proposed in the future, but that's on the east side of this project. So like this bike path, kind of goes from from nowhere to nowhere. So that's, I was just no. trying to understand why, the, why it looks like that. Actually, Doug, can I jump in for a second? I, sure. I think it's just a really simple thing. This is the east side, right? This project is on the east side of Highway 1. Yep. And so we've gone through, a, um, before you, just before you join the commission, we've gone through a series of um, review projects with this intersection. And the headline here is, that whole intersection redesign is designed with the concept of a west trail, an east trail, and a trail going up to Parisima Creek. So there's a lot of long-term planning that's gone into this and that design. It's not a trail to nowhere. It's just, you can't see it now because it's not on the ground. I understand that, but the, tr the trail proposed for the east side of Highway 1 would be on the east side of this project. So I don't understand why there is this made up bike path that goes through this protected area of uh, uh, along Highway 1, where that's not where the uh, long-term plan that you're talking about goes. So I'm trying to understand why it does that. It doesn't not, not just, oh, there's no, it doesn't connect to anything right now, but it doesn't connect to the, the, the proposal for in the future either. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't understand why it's, why it's like that. Well, I understand your question, but I don't think it's correct that the vision for the East Side Trail would be east of the property. You're saying it would be on Main Street. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's accurate. But Doug, maybe you know better than I do. Um, I it's been a while since I looked at those planning documents, so I don't want to go off half cocked here. It is something we'll take under advisement and we'll look into. Um, the goal, of course, is to connect all of these up into a, a cohesive network of trails. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's about all I can offer for now. Uh, on Chairman Ruddick, uh, I had a question about how many lots and residential units were included in this, and I, I'll kind of lump in some of the other comments here. Uh, what's proposed right now is eight, it's currently a single parcel. It is zoned residential uh, R2 for duplexes currently. Uh, the proposal includes subdividing it into uh, eight lots. So that could be a total of 16 residential units, uh, one duplex per lot. Um, under ADU law, they could theoretically include an ADU uh, in the duplexes. So that number is a little bit of a, that's kind of the, the maximum. Um, and in terms of, um, like I said, that came up a little bit later 
uh, and some other comments as to why the residential is is the the hotel kind of a smoke screen to allow the re the residential can go forward without the hotel. The property is zoned for duplexes. They could apply for if they did not do the subdivision, they could build that many duplexes on there with a coastal development permit. Um, if they want to subdivide it and have eight lots, they could also do that for residential. It's not dependent on the hotel. They can do that independent of whether or not the hotel is ever approved. Um, in this case, it's, it was partly um, the applicant came up with this idea in response to a lot of the comments. And I think some of this works for him and I'll defer to him to explain that, that um, now that he kind of to make the whole thing work, if he has fewer hotel rooms, but he can get some money through residential development, the numbers work. I have never looked at, you know, his pro forma, the numbers, I'm, I'm not gonna get into that. Um, so this is something that could go forward with or without the hotel, I think is the, the bottom line. Um, I hope that clarifies what's going on with the residential part of this. As far as not having designs for that at this point, we acknowledge that uh, at this point, because it is being considered as an alternative under CEQA and the EIR, um, we're not required to have final plans as when we're looking at the environmental impacts uh, as far as we'll, it will be evaluated in the EIR. We'll look at if you have fewer hotel rooms, but more residential units, how does that affect traffic and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the story poles that were put up for the residential, since we don't have designs, we just put up uh, story poles for the units that would be closest to the highway. And they're based on what would be allowed in that zoning district with the height and setbacks to build it on that a lot. As the project goes forward, if this alternative does seem to have legs and as the draft EIR moves along, we would anticipate that the applicant would firm up the designs for these residential units and we would have more to look at um, you know, before we get to an actual hearing to make decisions on it. Um, so it's partly because we're going through CEQA and it's, it's sort of rapidly changing and it takes a little bit of time to get the designs fleshed out. We wanna make sure it works from a CEQA standpoint first. Um, Commissioner Polgar um, had some questions about the 0.5 acre um, where the dealership would expand. Uh, I think the applicant can fill that in, but my understanding is there's gonna be no new buildings. It's just uh, essentially uh, parking and landscaping will be added there um, to facilitate moving the cars off of the north north of Seymour property. Um, that's uh, what I know of it and the applicant can fill in the details. Um, uh, for community member Hooker's comments, I think all of his are really best for the applicant and their architects to address. So I'm gonna defer to them on, on those questions. Um, uh, for committee member Kikuchi concerning the sign program, uh, it's an important question. I'm frankly just not familiar enough with where this project is to comment on um, if this is realistically what the signage will look like or not. Uh, I think the architect and the, the applicant can add some to that. Um, uh, for um, 
Linda Poncini. Um, I think I've sort of addressed that as far as we don't really have design details on the duplexes. We Those will be evolving over time. This is basically what we need to do an alternatives analysis under CEQA. Yes, that's great. Thank you for your responses. Um, for Commissioner Hernandez, um, as far as the economic conditions, the number of visitors, that sort of thing, and this also ties into some of the other comments about whether there's a need for hotels or not. Um, I haven't really been involved in that. I think the city manager's office is more involved in tracking like the hotel taxes, transit occupancy taxes, that sort of thing. Um, and also sort of through their economic development lens, um, working with the local businesses and updating the economic data. I know there are efforts going on as we're coming out of COVID to update that data, but I, I don't have a good response. I do know that there was a lot of concern uh, when we went into COVID uh, about, you know, the economy and taxes and it turned out that the hotels did quite well. Our, our transit occupancy tax numbers were way better than we had anticipated. Um, and a lot of it was just a shift in who the customers were. Uh, it was more Californians coming to spend a few days in Half Moon Bay versus somebody flying in from out of state. Um, the, from what I know, the hotels do pretty well, but it is seasonal. They have their peaks and lows. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to make broad statements about their, where they are as far as occupancy. Um, I do want to correct one statement um, from uh, the public comments that, um, that the Coast Cider failed and the city turned it into a homeless um, housing, um, that was actually the San Mateo County project. They did that using state money um, and they bought the property at fair market value. Um, as far as emerging, a lot of these comments from the public are really things that will be addressed in the environmental impact report. So I'm not gonna go through them one by one. I think uh, Chairman Ruddick touched on this, that we're talking about the architecture, site design today, things like water availability, emergency response. Those are all topics that get evaluated in the environmental impact report. And when that's released, there'll be plenty of time for people to read that and make their own opinions. Um, same thing with the story polls. Uh, I will note that we are, uh, they're not ready right now, but our consultants will be um, photographing the story polls and then they will actually from specific distances and angles and they can then um, fill in uh, some of the details of where the building would be to make it a little more clear um, as to what uh, you're actually looking at. Uh, we had some photos done, but it was such a foggy day, you couldn't see the hillside. So um, that's still a work in progress. Um, I think that's pretty much the clarifying questions. If, like I said, except for the ones that I think we probably should just defer to the applicant and their architects and consultants. If I've missed something, please let me know. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, just quickly before we go to Mr. Jameson and team, Commissioner Benjamin has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. I just, uh, as a way of sort of weaving together uh, the comments from Commissioner Gordon and Hernandez with respect to that wetland, uh, and the bicycle path. There was a, there's a coherent question about how the path works in conjunction with how the uh, wetland is protected. And of course, we don't expect to have the details that would be 
you know, expected in environmental documents. But we should note that our uh, our 100 foot buffer is a minimum buffer, and the specifics of the wetland seem like a subject that the applicant's consultant, who is here tonight, might have insight on. And uh, you know, the idea that it's sufficient, or maybe as uh, our wetlands expert, when we were working on this in the LCP, says maybe it needs more, maybe it needs less. I did hear a comment in the introduction that a certain amount of stormwater drainage was going to be on site. And uh, again, uh, in the staff report, some of it was going to be diverted to wetlands, some of it may be going elsewhere. So, understanding how downstream works um, seems like a very material part of thinking about this project. Uh, it's again, not that I expect the answer tonight, but that I'd be disappointed if the environmental documents didn't have a very clear description of that story. I also want to weave in um, the comments from uh, Ms. Beckman with respect to visuals, with the comments that uh, Doug made with respect to the story poles, because I think that's part of what we want to do here is pick up on the comments of, of the public and encourage a dialogue about them. Um, I went out on a, a, a sunny day, a clear day, and uh, stood on the California Coastal Trail on the west side of the highway, which of course is somewhat lower than the highway itself. And the, um, the story pole was above the ridge line. Now, uh, it was difficult for me to tell where the two-story and the three-story buildings distinguished themselves. There's only about a foot and a half difference in net elevation, so I'm not sure how material that is, but I, I do think that there's a reasonable question about really getting clarity on how the uh, the visual resource of the hillside is protected, um, particularly from the coastal trail, but also while you're parked on Highway 1, because not everybody is going to be driving by at 35 miles an hour. Um, a lot of times people experience that at much slower, if not stop speeds. So I, I'm hopeful that we can get uh, clarity on uh, on those topics as well as the sort of public-private question that I asked earlier, which seems to me to be integrated with the town boulevard concept at some point. So thank you for indulging me. I hope that makes for a good segue for the applicant and his consultants. Thank you, Commissioner Benjamin. Um, you, you said just now that standing on the California Coastal Trail, the building rises above the ridge line, but I think you mean the Na Naomi Patridge Trail just west of Highway 1. Thank you for that correction. You're absolutely right. From the coast trail, it's probably just fine. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, propose we go now to Mr. Jameson and team to answer uh, commissioner and com committee members' po uh, questions that have been posed. Hi. Okay, um, Rory, if, can we uh, pull up that uh, Google map out of the packet? Okay, maybe you can point along because I don't have access to that. Sure. Um, to clear up the question about the bike path, uh, the intent behind that was that the wetlands are, are exist where they are. And it was our goal in working with the Coastal Commission to protect that area. If we didn't develop, that bike path would have to go through the wetlands in the Caltrans right-of-way. And so that was the intent here. And the purpose of setting it 25 feet away from the um, wetlands is that the Coastal Commission had asked for 20 feet and I just bumped it out because you've got potentially a little fence that we can put along the west side of it to protect that area. So um, that is a parallel trail. That is the city's future. Um, I was following suit off a of history of what we've discussed. And yes, it is, it's a piecemeal, no question, but we can only do what we can do. And we thought it was a benefit to the community to put it in now so that later on, again, it doesn't have to go through the Caltrans right of way. So it does connect at the south end. It gives you access to cross the highway. And then the north end, it takes you to Seymour. So at least you get to that point. And obviously you can go um, back towards Main Street. But we at least complete one portion of it. 
Um, another item that came up that you guys discussed is regarding the property that is um, between the car dealership and the hotel. So that sliver there, uh, the intent behind this and creating those eight lots, and I don't know if you can drag that over so we can see the lots because I guess we're, and we can see part of them. Um, you can go back to the last picture though. Yeah. Anyway, we can see close enough. So those eight lots, the goal behind this was to create residential because, you know, there was an outcry in past meetings that this whole thing should be residential. But being that two acres of the five is open space, it only left three. And you can see the configuration of the property. It's very difficult to try to fit a project in there. And we put the, you know, obviously put the parking along Main Street to make it as clean as possible. And uh, then the hotel, obviously that is more attractive than looking at parking. So we created that. It was the cleanest way to fit it on there. But since we couldn't get the residential, uh, we decided, well, let's go ahead, adjust the property line. And so we can put cars from the dealership over in that other area. And, and uh, Sarah, your, your question there is, yes, that area would be paved so we can park vehicles on it to display vehicles or also for employees. But then on the north side of Seymour Street, we have the eight lots. Our goal at this point, and it's, it's pointed out in that document, but the first two lots closest to Main Street, those are, are duplex lots. They're, um, they, those would be built as affordable housing. And we can do up to six units, which would be fine by us. It would be two two bedrooms and four one bedrooms if we did it that way. Uh, all the par parking is internal. It's kind of like that project that's on Poplar. So the garages don't back out to Main Street, I mean, out to Seymour Street. You go in, so you, you have a garage and you also have, um, there's for each duplex, there's two car garage and then two other parking spaces. So there's plenty of parking on site. We didn't do drawings specific other than we were required to do the story pulls on the end unit. Um, to make clarification, the first two units we would build now, the next six units would not be built at this time. They would remain as they are. And uh, in the future, um, if something was to happen and change with the dealership at that time, we would, uh, would develop those. But in doing a subdivision map, it was easier to do all of it at once and then do the affordable portion now, because I, I know that was the desire was to have some affordable housing. And then if there's probably a concern about paving and, and concern about runoff, well, those, when those units get developed, there'll be a lot, right now it's all pavement. In the future, there'll be a lot more landscaping in that area. So part of that would be reduced and be more permeable. And then, you know, obviously we'd pave down on the other portion. So it gives you clarification on that portion there. As far as, um, let me go to your, your next item. Okay, the hotel, uh, a remark came up earlier. The hotel is actually 102 rooms. And uh, so we've come down, I didn't think we were gonna get all these details, but you guys asked some questions, so I'll throw it out there. The hotel was originally 113,000 square feet back in 2016. Now it's down to under 67,000 square feet. So it's 55, 59% of its original size. Parking was 198 spots, now it's down to 108. And that's 55%. Um, and then the guest room is 148 to 102. Uh, open space has increased dramatically. Um, we're now at two acres. And then the wetlands we didn't even know existed originally. And now we're at, um, you know, the 100 foot buffer. So, you know, it's a give and take on these different items trying to get the best uh, project we can fit on the property. Um, the question about do we need hotel rooms? Well, we just lost 52 hotel rooms, um, the Coast Side Inn. So, the impact to me on this project is if we add 102, we're actually adding 50 rooms to the city. And I do know that there's probably some benefits to the TOT tax long-term. So I don't think that's a bad thing. Employment, I think a lot of the people that would work here are right in the neighborhood. And it would be very easy for them to walk to work. At the car dealership now, we've got a couple people that live on the next block and they walk to work and love it. It's very easy for them. So there's some benefits there as well. Uh, the bike shop location, 
we just thought it was a simple location to be. And your concern about, Chad, about how you get out to the bike path, our intention, it, it, we could do that. We could run something down the side to join that bike path, or they can, you know, just take a main street down to the street light. Cause I think a lot of people will be using the trails and, and, or they may be going down main street, but it, that's something we could work out either way. That's, that's not a big item. So what else we got? Signage. I don't have an answer for you there. Um, we can do whatever. Um, you know, Hyatt has the requirements on what they'd like to see. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I think we can do backlit if that's beneficial. Um, but obviously, I know it's a concern of the city. So, we, you know, we'll make it low key to it, you know, whatever is required. I think there may be other questions. Those are the things I can think of. The other items that you brought up, I think that Rory can answer because those are more defined to the to the um, hotel itself. It was about the solar. Well, the solar, one of the questions was, why is it not on both buildings? It can be. We put it on one of the buildings with the intent that we can expand it in more areas. Solar's cost is dropping in the future. And uh, the type of roof we have, a standing seam roof, it attaches to the roof. So we don't have to do specific penetrations, but we can provide um, conduit in all the areas. So our goal was eventually we can expand on that. And that, that's the same truth with the EV stations. We are, we're gonna put them in in the parking lot, but we also have the ability to expand it to a lot more spaces because I do believe uh, it, not too far in the future that you're gonna have a lot more electric vehicles and we will need a lot more spaces for that. So we're planning for that as well. Um, questions regarding glazing and uh, the colors and the columns, I think, um, Rory, I think you could probably answer those questions instead of me. Thanks, Greg. Um, and yeah, great questions. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, this bay here uh, facing uh, parking and then Main Street is where that uh, laundry and break room would be. Um, and my expectation would be that um, this bottom panel would probably be uh, spandle. And so you would have glazing above about four foot six um, so that you know, there's, there's daylight in those rooms for staff, um, but so you're not looking at the side of a, a washing machine uh, from across the street. Uh, definitely want to avoid that. Um, as far as the, the posts, um, I, I think we really were envisioning um, pipe steel um, as a more rugged um, palette. Um, and then as far as the, the building being dark, um, certainly I think this is this is relatively early in design, so we would be, of course, proposing um, uh, real material samples um, before we get, you know, have a, a final vote. Um, so we can we can put that in front of you um, and in front of ourselves to evaluate. Um, I will say that earlier on we studied it with a, a much lighter palette, including you know sort of white where there's charcoal. Um, and in response to comments, as, as soon as we rendered it um, in, in the darker palette. It really looked a lot better. It, it didn't um, uh, pop from the landscape in quite the same way, which I think is, is a positive uh, when you're going to blend in. Um, and, and we could share those perspectives again in future submission. Um, but uh, I guess to say we we recommend the darker palette, um, but we're also, of course, open to calibrating the darker palette uh, with real materials to get it where it needs to be. Um, and then I guess the last question on the solar, I think, as Greg said, you know, as, as the design develops, we would um, work with the vendor and with our electrical engineer, size the building's loads, um, uh, get an estimate of what the uh, solar array would generate, and then size that array um, to, to meet the building's needs um, above or below, depending on, on what the owner wants to do. Um, I think there is, there is flexibility to um, expand the size of what's proposed if necessary. Covers it. Did I miss anything? I had one clarifying question. Um, when I could, could you just clarify the um, whether there's affordable housing or low income housing with this project, and and what percentage of the housing units that are proposed with this would fit into either of those buckets? Okay, so I had worked with MedPen over the last couple of years trying to do a 
a larger project here in Half Moon Bay on another property. Um, at this point, that has not come together, but I learned quite a bit about that system, and they have different levels of incomes to extremely low to moderate and so forth. There's different levels. I think it would be our intention to have two of three different levels, and that would be the goal. And one of the reasons behind that, everybody just thinks of just extremely low is the beneficial, but there's a lot of people over here that have middle incomes that can't afford to live here either. So I think by having a mix of those units, you have the ability to um, provide something for everybody. Thank you for that. We um, we we really need to move forward. Good, good chair, Mr. Mr. Hooker has his hand raised. Yeah, I'm about to call on him, Rick. Chad, uh, if you can be quick so we can get to the Maybe gist I of this meeting, I'd I appreciate I have it. One additional question for the architect that seems to have slipped through the cracks. I'm curious about what sort of fence or other demising there is between the hotel development and the. Uh, new portion of the truck uh, Ford display lot. What is that line? Um, can I respond to that? Please. Please. Yeah, that, that fence that would separate the dealership would, uh, you know, be, be to the city code. Um, I don't know if it needs to be um, a decorative fence, but it would be a standard probably six foot to seven foot fence, at least for a portion of it, um, to separate you know, one commercial property from the other. But as far as the materials, you know, we're open to materials to what you know is going to look nice because obviously we want that a nice look for the um, for the hotel. Thank you, Jay. Well, thanks very much. I, on behalf of the Planning Commission, I thank Mr. Jameson and his team for the for being here for such a constructive dialogue tonight. And uh, it was said during public hearing that a faceless corporation is behind this project. And yet Mr. Jameson has been working in good faith with the city for years on this and has lived in Half Moon Bay probably longer than any of the rest of us. <laughs> so um, let's, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break now. We'll come back and have uh, Lots of time for committee and, and commission deliberation. So can we regroup at 920, please?
the part of the meeting where we uh, where commissioners and committee members have the opportunity to um, pontificate on these issues and to give input for going forward to staff and the applicant team. Uh, we'll do at least a couple of rounds, so don't feel please like you have to have to weigh in on everything in your mind on, on the first round. And again, we want to concentrate on the siting and design as part of this study session. So who would like to kick it off for us? Commissioner Hernandez, please. Um, I've, <clears throat> I've been involved with this project since the original um, meetings that we had going back to 2016. And so I think it's important to put in place context of what we're looking at today versus what we looked at five years ago. Um, there was a lot of public concern about the size and scale of the project on the site at that time. There was a lot of uh, feedback on the design. And um, I think as Mr. Jamison indicated, there was a, a, an awareness raising that happened around the fact that there were actually wetlands on the property. So I think these are all things that have happened since the original project was proposed. And I think if we, if we look at where we've come in five years, the concept of a town boulevard is actually a critical component of what we think about with our city. We've commissioned an anchor point on the south end of town to actually be that anchor point for where core development really stops. Um, and we have policies that have been put in place by our city council that say we want to concentrate and our land use plan, which has recently been passed, which says we want to concentrate development in the downtown, all of the downtown from the south of Main Street to the north of Main Street where the commercial downtown is. We um, have also spent a lot of time looking at an integrated bike and pedestrian master plan that connects the city together. And when I look at this project, it seems to think about all of those elements, it does a pretty good job of in integrating most of them. And so I think that it's, it's important for us to understand that a great deal of progress has been made. I know that some people are concerned about any development in Half Moon Bay. The applicant could put housing that would have a much bigger impact on the site. And that's something for us to think about. That's an alternative to this, is something that is actually much more, um, impactful in some respects. Uh, so, so I just wanted to lay out the big picture context as we go into this. I mean, generally speaking, um, you know, there are questions that need to be answered at a future date around, do we need hotels? What does the Chamber of Commerce think? You know, those types of the environmental issues, obviously they're very important. I will say the, the I've probably spent more nights at, in hotels in the last 10 years and anybody here. Uh, this looks like a Hyatt place. It speaks the design language of Hyatt and Hyatt places, but it is not, it's probably the most interesting Hyatt place I've ever seen on paper, but it still speaks that design language of Hyatt place. So kudos to the architects for melding the design language of Half Moon Bay into the design language of the Hyatt place. I would say that there are areas for improvement that have already been raised around the palette, the contrast. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing from my perspective, there's two issues. The first one is the view of the hills. I mean, we've raised this issue before in other projects, the view, the, the, the ridge line and where it looks when you're at the median point on highway one is, is always a concern. I think that we also have to look at this in the context of our larger development goals and policy objectives that the city council has set, which is, concentrate development in the core of the downtown. And if you look at the Cunha gym that was recently approved, if you look at other development projects that do ob obstruct the views of the Ridge Line, this is including residential developments that Mr. McGregor put on Poplar and Highway 1. These are consistent with the pattern of development we see from Main, the south end of Main Street to the north end of Main Street. So I think we need to think about that, maybe have a deeper dialogue about that, what's appropriate or not. But this is certainly shorter, smaller, 
more contrast in the architecture. Articulation, I think, is the term that you guys use. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's a big change from where we started. I think the, um, I think that's, there's another point that I think is worth raising, um, but I've lost my notes. So I will turn over to my colleagues and I'll wait for the second round. No worries. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin, please. Uh, thank you. I don't want to take my turn except to set up our colleagues on the uh, Architectural Advisory Committee. Um, one of the earlier points of feedback that we had heard from the committee was that the massing of the hotel was uh, appeared larger because the space between the two structures was small and they suggested a widening. And uh, I'm really interested in hearing from them about how they how they feel this design responds to that comment. I'll have my, my own comments later, but I just wanted to try to get that one up on the table for them. Thank you. Good, yes, well, we're, we're all interested in, in uh, all views that the, the AAC members care to share. Uh, Linda? You're muted, Linda. Um, there you that was That was my first thought when I reviewed these plans is that one of the key um, discussion topics we had at the AAC with the previous design was that uh, we really wanted to see this separation between the building masses so that you can see through that it was uh, glassy, that there was a sense that um, there was movement, people movement, visual movement between the buildings. And uh, we talked about having three buildings with two uh, spaces between. And one thing about uh, design elements is that things work better in odd numbers and you get a better um, uh, balance of um, massing if you can get three things or five things, but in this case, three probably, with some space in between or um, a roof form that gets lower and then something could be higher next to it. And I, that was the first thing that I really noticed about this design. Now, having said that, I do want to compliment um, the design team. I think that the, the design and the colors, I like the colors. I think it's nice and sophisticated. And I think that the materials that are being used are, are going to look nice. Um, so I think it's that spacing of the massing. It, that was the one thing that really struck me about it. And I'd like to hear what my colleagues think. But uh, I also wanted to comment on the, um, the sheet that has the Farmhouse Modern Design Language Guides um, that is included in the, in the set. When you look at all of those images, most of them are single story. Some of them are two story and they also have very steep roof pitches. And I think that is what makes those very appealing. And what, what we're looking at here, there are not steep roof pitches. It's really a, a very low slope roof typically. Um, so if there were a way to uh, work dormers more as opposed to these sort of uh, uh, just pop-ups with a big roof over it. Um, I think that would help. Um, but I think that I think that the applicant and their architect and their design team are, are on their way. I think they're going in a good direction in terms of how the materials work together and how it um, how it feels. I think that some of the massing and maybe the roof pitches need to be looked at. Um, but I do like uh, the window uh, breakups, the large window areas. I think, I think that's very nice and that's an improvement. So that's my overall comment about the architecture and um, just wanted to start off with that and say, I think it's, it's going in a good direction, um, but certainly the massing needs to be worked on, so. That's my <laughs> comment for the moment. Thank you for that. Do uh, committee members Kikuchi or Hooker want to 
uh, comment on, on while, while we're in this space? Uh, Chad, please. Um, I'd like to say that I think the overall building design and materials uh, are very nice. I especially appreciate the effort to uh, sort of step back from just the hotel project on this site alone and consider the larger issue of housing in the area and uh, how those lots can be developed, uh, the development needs that our town has and not pinning the dealership down by uh, building the hotel right up against the south property line of the dealership. I think this is a, this is a good move and it's in the town's interest to uh, utilize our, our um, cat, utilize our uh, residentially zoned property for residential uses. <laughs> um, I, I also like the comments that were made about uh, gray water and uh, how it will be uh, used for irrigating the site and the EV planning I think is good. Overall, I'm, I'm pleased to see those things. Um, when I looked at the story polls, the thing that is uh, much less the view from Highway 1 to the hills, because although I realize that in theory and on paper, those are views that are supposed to be preserved, I think the people who are headed north on Highway 1 have got open views of the hills to the east for many, many miles. And when you get to that stretch of Highway 1 that's from our south Main Street intersection that will now have a light. That's a section there where the, the traffic is two lanes in each direction, soon to become one lane in each direction with yet another traffic light. There will be a crosswalk. If you're driving there, you better be looking at the road, not the, not the distant hills. My concern about what I saw with the story poles went more to the blockage of all the views from the housing that's uh, north of the theater. And it came back to the ideas that we had expressed earlier about massing of the buildings and getting some space between them. And I, you know, I, it just seems to be one of the psychological issues I have. I tend to pull out vellum and lay it over somebody else's work and draw little sketches and pictures all the time. So I did a little of that and it makes me wonder if you couldn't have three buildings instead of two where uh, the third small building would be essentially where the bike shop is now and running towards Main Street taking up some parking spaces there, but you'd create a space between the two primary buildings that face the highway that would be more like 80 feet instead of 16 feet. Is it the least bit practical to do an 80 foot gap there that you, you would build some sort of a, a glazed enclosure as a hallway? Is that even remotely practical? Uh, I don't know, but it's a, it's a thought that, that there could be a space there. And it, when you put that on, uh, presentation drawing page 12, when you think about taking about a third of the north building and placing it elsewhere, it opens up quite a view corridor from the residential area. Um, whether there was uh, some pragmatic ideas or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but it's just a thought I had. And then, come on, Kate, give me a break here. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's my comments, thank you. Thank you, committee member yeah. Hooker. Uh, committee member Kikuchi, please. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I think that the applicant has made some great strides and great efforts to improve this project since we last saw it. Uh, and I commend them for that. I, I, uh, no, I think uh, I think the reduction in the quantity of the buildings and uh, the architectural characters are, uh, are great improvements. Um, I think I think contrary or possibly not contrary, but maybe to a greater degree, uh, my some of my concerns previously were the building massing and how it did affect some distant views, especially a, uh, as you're approaching the city from the south and you approach uh, the Highway 1 Main Street intersection and what the building massing did to the distant hills, not, not the hills immediately to the west, but maybe more of the hills that are more distant to the, uh, to the north and the blockage of those hills. 
And I, I think that even became more evident after the story polls came up as you uh, approach town and from a further distance away, those hills uh, are pretty much obscured now. And um, that concerns me. And I also uh, think that there is a certain loss of the coastal hills as you head south on our Highway 1 and as you, as you look towards the, uh, the east. So that concerns me as well. And I, you know, I, I, I greatly appreciate the fact that the entire footprint of the building has been reduced, but I'm almost wondering if, it, if there was another solution that they should have looked at, such as possibly uh, a couple two-story buildings and one one one-story building, possibly. And the loss of the open space might have been better served if it was a one-story building that offset the, the third story on the, uh, on the northernmost building. Um, so I think those are my, those are my comments. I, I, uh, I was concerned last time, like, as Linda said, with the continual wall effect of the building and, and its connection. So I think, I think the reduction of the uh, three buildings down to two helps that immensely, but it, 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 it could be improved even further, I think. Thank you for that. Do commissioners have um, deliberations to share? Vice Chair Polgar. Um, thank you. I, um, I just wanted to strongly echo um, uh, committee member Poncini's comments. I really agreed with, and those really resonated with me, the comments about uh, the design. And I, I, I really liked the uh, kind of farmhouse modern uh, concept that the architects are, are going for and but it didn't really seem to get there so I think it's it's on its way I think it's a good style for this location um, and so but it wasn't really there and I couldn't put it into words but um, <laughs> can remember Pacini did a very good job of describing what it meant and I agree very much about the massing and that it would be better with odd numbers um, I do think that that like having uh, three buildings I felt like it actually felt very much like a wall um, in part because even though one, I know that the southern building is two stories and the, and the um, northern building is three stories, but reality is that they're almost the same height. So they really don't feel like there's any variation to me in that sense, in terms of height. And it definitely blocks, you know, a lot. Uh, and I, I really strongly agree that it is a big, big loss for the residents on Main Street. Um, so thinking about a way to use some of the space, I, I um, in, in, to, to create three buildings that allow for more um, space between. Um, I really, I, I would like that. I'd also like to see more variability in the height um, it, as well. I think that would help. To me, part of what I, I think was a challenge is that um, in particularly from the highway, it, the, it's very repetitive um, at this point. It, or it seems a, somewhat repetitive. I don't want to overstate that I, I, I do still like it. Like there's a lot I like about this. Um, so, uh, but I appreciated um, uh, Commissioner Pancini's uh, suggestions um, as well as the other uh, suggestions we just heard. Um, I, uh, I think those are some kind of key things. I also do think, um, I, I did think it was a little too dark um, and if there were ways to incorporate more of natural materials um, in kind of to, for a little bit of variation, I think that would be better. I hear though the, the concern about the white and that it popped out. I wasn't such a, not thinking necessarily that, um, but it was, it is pretty dark. Um, so uh, those are some thoughts. I'll be honest, I am definitely a bird and bunny kind of gal, but I, these are fairly remnant wetlands. Uh, we uh, definitely need to protect them and follow our, our requirements um, in terms of buffers. And I see that that is being done here. Um, I very much appreciate that they are trying to build the pat plan in and have the bike path uh, to accommodate the east side trail. As part of this, I see that there's confusion and or it could be frustrating that doesn't go anywhere right now. Um, as someone who's been involved in a lot of trail projects, um, I can say it takes a time and they happen piecemeal. So I appreciate that it has been incorporated with thought into this. Um, 
but I guess I'm not as concerned about the kind of trying to improve these wetlands. I'll be quite honest, they are very, they are very isolated. Um, and so to, my two cents on it is that these are not, um, there's not a lot of connectivity. And frankly, uh, a lot of the benefits of, of these types of wetlands is they're, in a, they're, they're part of a mosaic. Um, these are isolated by a highway and a road on both sides. So, you know, wildlife that's trying to move and migrate to other areas is going to get squashed um, or hit by cars. So I think that there's still, that, that doesn't change. I, I really like the plant choices. I think that having those pollinators is great. Um, species like Ceanothus, the scrub species they were suggesting, I'm all for it. Um, I'm just like, I don't want to, from my perspective, I'm not sitting here thinking like, that, that I see this as like, we're gonna achieve wonderful habitat that will provide a, a great ecosystem benefit or function, just being realistic about this site and what it is. Um, that is not a comment that I don't think we should fulfill the requirements and do our best to create good habitat. So, but I, what I heard from the, um, the team about the plantings and sounded very good to me. Um, and so there's, I, I uh, there's, I have some other thoughts, but I think I'm going to pause there at this point. Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Commissioner Gorn, please. Hey there. So um, uh, when I looked at the, I see two paths there, the bike path and the, the walking path. And they do not seem to me to be on the perimeter of the, um, you know, the the the, uh, the wetland. That they seem to cut through the the buffer zone. And, um, so, I'm. I think that in the future, like as you get, to, we're not talking about the EIR. We're talking about the the general look. Um, to me. It looks like the bike path is there for the drawings and not for, um, it doesn't look realistic. So I think you are gonna run into some trouble if you don't have the bike path go on the outer perimeter of the, the wetland buffer zone. Um, and then also adding a, a pedestrian path as well. It, it's, there may be too much there. I think that the, um, uh, like Sarah just said, the front of the building is beautiful. Like, I think that's, I think it looks really good. I think that, that there's a reason that all of the, um, the pro, you know, all the literature we got, all the, the layouts that we got open with that, um, the, the shot of the front, because that's really well done. When you get toward the back, um, there is a, a sameness, um, and, and Chad's commented about the darkness of it. I get that too. Um, and so I think that they're probably going to need to spend a little bit more time on that back, that back end. Um, I know the bike path looks really good up front, but you might want to think about putting it on the backside. So um, that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin, please. I am uh, continually uh, humbled by the architectural sensitivities of um, my colleagues and the Architectural Review Board. I agreed with all of their insights. Um, in particular, uh, Chad, I, I agree that there is an impact to the um, to the view from the for the residents at uh, in that section of Main Street, um, and I'm as I'm sure you know, our our policies don't actually demand that we protect that in the same way that it demands that we protect the view from Highway One. But if we can find a win win, that's that's great with me. Um, I felt that Steve articulated much better than I could um, my sense of the loss of the hills um, in ways that I just, you know, I, I would not have found the words either like Sarah. 
I just, you know, uh, I know a good insight when I see it. And I, I felt like he captured that when I was walking it on the, the Naomi Patridge Trail. Thank you, Chair Ruddick. Um, I, I, I felt like I lost that and it wasn't hard to project what it would be like on the road. Um, I agree that when people are driving, they need to be focused on the road. There are pedestrian, uh, sorry, there are other people in the car who are entitled to that protection of you as well, even if they're not driving and whose attention may not be under as much demand. So I do think that the, uh, the, the protrusion above the hill is an issue that needs to be worked on. Um, and I, I think also there needs to be a gradual movement. I, I don't believe that we've changed enough of our, um, our zoning ordinance and the other parts of the municipal code. But as I recall, there's supposed to be a, a gradual reduction as we move into the open areas and move out of the more sort of urbanized houses right up on top of Highway 1 at Poplar or, or at uh, Magnolia. And then houses are more distant, like when you're looking at the Johnson House. And I felt like this was a very abrupt change. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, as the design evolves, we can find a way to capture that. I thought that, and one way to think about that was the pitch of the roofs. Once again, that's something that I would never, it would never have occurred to me in a thousand years that that might be a thing. But um, I'm hopeful that uh, architectural minds better than mine can find a way to seize on these ideas and amplify them. Um, with respect to the wetlands, um, I guess I'm, I'm ambivalent. Uh, I appreciate uh, Vice Chair Polgar's comment about it being pretty isolated. Uh, and certainly, you know, even though there's uh, a lot of traffic on Highway 1 and uh, animals that were moved to it uh, could certainly be threatened, um, a wetland provides water quality services independent of its habitat value. Um, and I feel like um, the pro form 100 feet doesn't necessarily uh, reflect the opportunity and the needs of this particular wetland. Um, I think it makes sense to have a better, better view of that. Um, I also heard ambiguity about how much of the uh, storm flow was going to be absorbed. Uh, and again, in the context of um, water quality services that would be provided by this wetland or the swales or the other vegetative features in this area. I, I really hope that we can get clarity about what stormwater runoff looks like from this parcel, because over and over again, Half Moon Bay has proven that we do not know how to move water to the ocean without creating an erosion problem. And this seems to me an opportunity to work with a well thought design, you know, and make sure that we are, that we have really can demonstrate that we can do it better than our, our predecessors have. I certainly hope so. Um, with respect to the location of the bicycle trail um, relevant to the, the wetlands buffer, I understand that there's an architectural value and maybe even a safety value in some separation between pedestrians and uh, bicycles. Um, it is true, I, I, a former Commissioner Evans pointed out that when people were moving at different velocities on the same path, uh, it could present potential problems. Uh, that said, uh, it does seem to me that, you know, a, uh, unless the trail is like super pervious, um, it, I think it compromises the value of the buffer. And I hope that we can take a very close look at um, minimizing the adverse impact. And as Commissioner Gorn has pointed out, one way to do that would be to move it further away from the from the wetland itself. And once we understand what the wetlands requirements are, we'll have a better idea about what the, what's really required there. Um, you know, 100 feet is a minimum, it's not necessarily a maximum. Um, I feel 
I still feel pretty unclear. Uh, maybe everybody got it but me, but there's this duality of public private. Um, steel feels really soft to me in this design. Um, I, I'll, I'm glad everybody that spoke to the uh, charging stations liked the idea. I think it's I think it's great, and I I commend the applicant for planning for uh, EV headroom. Um, but I'll just speak to my my own personal experience. I just got back from a month of travel um, across country. I went to Gloucester and then back over on I-80, back on I-40 for the last almost a month. And uh, I had to char I drive an electric vehicle, so I had to charge my car a lot. And what I found was that uh, the charging stations I needed were at hotels. They were at places that could be like this. And the ability to use them was central to being able to, for an EV to uh, make headway in an area. And it wasn't like there was a, you know, a, a J1772 uh, thing that you plugged in and you went to sleep and you got up in the morning and it had a full charge. You were in it, you know, whether it was a, I, I happened to drive a Tesla, but it could easily have been a, a chart, a high power charger, a direct current charger for some other product. You'd be in it for a while and then you'd, uh, you'd unplug and you'd go on your way. That's not something that probably would be justified by, let's say, 100 hotel guests and some percentage of them driving EVs. But if there were a public value there, that might make a difference. That would be something that, you know, the, the people who want to drive electric vehicles into the beach area could could actually use and it would make a difference. It would actually uh, address an important underdeveloped uh, coastal access requirement for people who drive electric vehicles. And I think it might be worth exploring. Um, I, uh, I wanna respect that, you know, I'm not here to, to mandate that, but I hope it's something that, that is interesting. Uh, I was really glad to hear uh, the plans were thinking ahead also for uh, solar. Uh, beyond what was actually going to be installed. I, I appreciate the optionality that the applicants described about thinking there might be an even better, more efficient, higher powered uh, roof available. That might be another advantage if we get some additional massing reductions by increasing the area. Maybe we get some more, some more uh, areas for uh, solar deployment. Um, so yeah, I think that that covered most of my my big concerns. Um, maybe while the other folks come back with their second concerns, I'll I'll get a second win. But thank you for being so patient. And again, uh, Architectural Review Committee, my hats off. Thank you, Commissioner Benjamin. Well, I'll, I'll make a few observations myself now. Um, uh, as you all know, the the city's land use plan includes numerous policies that are relevant to this project uh, in, in largely in chapter nine uh, about visual, uh, visual scenic and visual quality. Uh, it's, uh, we're required to try to assure new development is visually compatible with the character of its setting. And uh, the phrase coastal compatibility is used. And I, I think I'll add my voice to maybe everyone else's in, in praise of the material palette and the colors that have been presented. The, the, our members of the AAC have more uh, nuanced insights into that than, than I ever would. So I'll, I'll just say that I, for, for me, I, I find both the, the palette and the, and the colors to be fine. Um, I, think, I think there are uh, uh, several positive changes in this version of the project, which, which uh, should be noted. Um, the fact that the the uh, open space on, on the parcel is now up to 40% of total, I think is, a, is a, a very positive move in a lot of ways. And I think having the, the bike path and the pedestrian path, if indeed it makes sense for them to be two separate ones, I'm not sure. I, I do think it's a little visionary, but, but it, it's a big positive. Uh, if and when this hotel is built, the, the safety improvements at that intersection just south of it 
will exist and you'll be able to walk or ride your bike safely uh, down to the end of Main Street and cross Highway 1 and get on the Naomi Patridge Trail to at least as far south as Wavecrest Avenue and maybe f- further by then. Uh, but that'll be that'll be your entryway to the bluff tops, uh, which is, you know, God, some of the most wonderful biking territory anybody could want. Uh, I, I also think that the value of the of the open space on in this project is important. Uh, and I understand the the um, point of view that the, the massing situation might be helped by lowering the, the height of the buildings or having three buildings instead of two with, with greater separation. <clears throat> but I'd, I'd be careful about sacrificing that, uh, you know, uh, significant parts of that open space for that solution. To me, that's a, a kind of a tough trade-off. The policy 9-6 requires us to, uh, <clears throat> to make sure new development is cited and designed to protect public views of scenic and visual resources area. So clearly, we, we those of us who have walked down and looked at the story poles, um, there is some, uh, they, they obviously will uh, occlude the views of the ridges to the east from certain locations. Uh, but I think that I think the latest version of this project has made um, a good faith efforts to minimize the the impact on the visual resources. If you look at how how large the setback from Highway One is right now, I think that's very laudable. It's probably the maximum setback that could be uh, brought to bear on that project. Also, the uh, the height, the heights of the buildings do not violate what the zoning requires there. And um, I like the, I think it's a positive that the, the long north-south orientation of the site that kind of minimizes the profile of the project as you're coming north on, on Highway 1. Now there is, there is a, in, in, in trade-off, there is, a, there is a, <clears throat> a, a bigger, a longer impact when you're directly west of the building. Um, the, the, uh, the fact that the, the heights of the building are graduated from south to north, going from lower to higher, I think also helps the, uh, the, the profile of that. And the, um, the, the way that the, in the north building, the third floor is sort of tucked into the roof, I think is also a, a, a move in the right direction to, to minimize the, the impact on the, on the visual resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that I'll, I'll stop there for now and uh, invite uh, everyone to, to have another turn. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez, you're muted, Rick. Thank you. I remembered my point because so much of, there's so much commonality in the themes, and um, uh, Ms. Ponsini brought up the point around the, the design c- concern, the twos versus the threes. I think there's another, it reminded me of my, my biggest concern with this project, which is there's no, this is a beautiful design. There are a lot of things to laud in what this represents, what this looks like. There's some things we can quibble about, but it still lacks any kind of signature element for such an important structure on the south end of town. I think this concept of twos versus threes, ones or threes or fives, like the, that's a pretty common element. I, I think if there's something we can do to maybe use a signature element, um, there are other things that are being proposed on that site. Like there's where the cheddar wedge is, uh, maybe that could be incorporated in. Um, but But I think something needs to be done to create a signature element that really makes the property stand out and draw people in to the downtown. Because the function, if you look, we have competing priorities and competing policies in our land use plan. The function this property serves is a transition space. You're going from a largely undeveloped area into a developed area, and it signals those things. And I think if you could incorporate a signature element that communicates that visually, you, 
it, it's lacking. And, and this is something that we've discussed previously. Um, so I, I will say, I've got a couple other things. Like I, I agree with uh, the, the, everybody's comments, uh, Chairman Ruddick, your comments in particular about uh, you know, the trade-offs that are happening here with, with the, the, the Ridgeline views. I think that um, the thing that I would also encourage is, you know, we have a space that can take advantage of outdoor, the outdoor area. I don't know if it fits into the Hyatt Place design language, but I would encourage folks to consider, do you expand the hotel patios, uh, the decks, so that they're more usable for the patrons, so they can actually appreciate the views versus just stand outside on them? Uh, the extended patio downstairs by the restaurant and bar, um, I would consider, is there something you can do to add bocce courts or maybe extend that area so it's a little bit larger so that people can appreciate that space? Certainly COVID's taught us that there's um, a lot more to appreciate with, with space. Overall, and, and by the way, Jimmy's comments as well of this is a property, it's not just a transition space, but it also serves as, as this sort of quasi public thing. I'm, a, I'm in, I agree with, I'm going to channel my internal Commissioner Evans and say, yeah, it's important to have different speeds at which a pedestrian goes and a bike goes, and it's nice to separate those out. Um, we've gone through a lot of iterations on this project. And I think I've seen berms, I've seen lots of uh, organic matter put forth. I think we're going to see that in the future. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we see something that's more rehabilitative of the wetlands that are there and actually will make them much better than they are now. The, the thing I would, I would just encourage everybody to think about a little bit is this has been going on for five years and I'm the only one who's here at the beginning other than I think one other member of, st of city staff um, who's not here tonight. Um, I wanna be careful that we're not whipsawing the applicant through go back and forth, back and forth because there are trade-offs, right? If we want this farmhouse modern, which I agree with, we're not at farmhouse modern, that, that has not been accomplished. Um, but we're also saying previously, hey, make this project smaller. It's hard to have a big barn when we're telling people to make it smaller. So we need to sort of understand that there are gonna be trade-offs here. And, and this has been going on for a while, um, but I agree with almost all of the comments that have been put forth. And I'm hopeful that when we look at this in the future, we'll see landscaping that really helps us feel that we've transitioned from rural coastal into the core commercial and you know, visitor serving downtown area. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. I'm, I'm gonna very quickly agree with you about the, uh, the opportunity for the gateway there at the south end of town. In, in fact, the, uh, our, our policy 9-18 requires us to uh, think creatively about wayfinding at the, at the city's gateways. Now, I don't know in, in the case of the south gateway if that would be the responsibility of the city and or the applicant, but I'd like to see us think about that. Further comments from committee members or commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Benjamin. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I appreciate the, I appreciate your calling out the specific policies with respect to uh, thinking creatively. And I, I confess I do not have my policies at the tip of my tongue uh, but I'm pretty sure we have a very specific policy with respect to uh, not protruding above the ridge line. I, I could probably find it, but you probably could find it faster than me. And um, uh, I'm sure it gives us some wiggle room and I wanna respect that. But I also uh, think it deserves, it deserves to be weighted with the clarity that the text has provided. Um, and I appreciate uh, the point that Rick made about uh, trying to deal with uh, uh, competing designs. How do you make it large, you know, farmhouse modern and still make it small massing? I defer to you guys as to how we do that. But I do have this clear policy that I'm visualizing that talks about not protruding above the ridge line. Um, 
And the fact that we've done it uh, further into town at Magnolia and Poplar to me uh, doesn't speak to this one um, in the same way. This is larger, it's more signature. Um, I, I also wanted to pick up on uh, a comment. It was, a, it was a little bit whimsical, but there was a grain of truth in it uh, about the adjacent Coastside Fire Protection District. Um, I'm not sure how the design um, interacts with some of the visual and uh, sonic qualities of being at a fire station. And uh, again, you know, I'm sure that's a challenge uh, that uh, the architects could speak to far better than I could. Um, but I hope that uh, the way the design evolves will have a chance that, you know, guests won't walk away saying, that's a really nice place, but damn, the fire station uh, sirens going off. And, you know, the, it was fun to look out the balcony and see the, uh, the smoke training in the, in the tower. I don't think, you know, I think we want to be clear about how those things interact, not just in the, within the parcel or even within the parcel and the open spaces and views adjacent, but with some of those adjacent uses. I appreciate that the, uh, that the Playhouse folks, uh, the idea that the Playhouse folks might enjoy having dinner or a drink there before they go to a show. I don't know enough about the operations of the Playhouse that that they wouldn't see that as a threat to one of their fundraising sources, uh, but it would be good to check that out, um, uh, I think, beforehand. Um, and uh, again, you know, I, I just want to emphasize that I think getting clarity on um, the public private quality with respect to the electric vehicle stations will tell me a lot about what's envisioned for this parcel. Um, I will say that. Um, the usual way we protect wetlands is we declare a buffer and we kind of put in a split rail fence or we have a condition that says the property owner is supposed to leave this area alone. And you know, in the back of a residential parcel, that's probably enough. But in an open public space like this, I think we may need a little more. I think we might need to buff up what it means to provide clarity about what it means to stay out of the buffer. Um, that doesn't mean that we should be, you know, putting in a steel wall or some crazy thing like that. But, you know, maybe a monument. I've seen this happen when I was in Gloucester earlier this month. I saw that uh, wetland areas were marked with a, they had a big boulder and they had a, a plaque on the boulder that says, this area is protected in perpetuity. Don't go here. And you know, it was a boulder, it was a nice feature. It wasn't kind of jumping out at you, but it was a signage that was helpful, that communicated the intent of the policy. And it was effective as far as I could see. Uh, it also speaks to uh, committee member Kikuchi's comments about uh, lighting. I really appreciate that this is a super sensitive site. And uh, you know, I don't think any of us would disagree that whitewash in this area would be hideous, uh, you know, low louvered, downcast, minimal is what we need here as far as lighting is concerned. Um, so thanks again for the chance to comment on it and thanks to the applicant for being such a good listener. Thank you, Commissioner Benjamin. Uh, your memory about the, the policy with respect to the ridgeline views is, is right on. It's a uh, 923, and it says that new development must be cited and designed to minimize intrusion into the ridgeline. And, and that's, that's what I was trying to say in my first round of comments, that I think there are several important changes in the current version that is definitely trying to minimize intrusion. Uh, committee member Hooker. Uh, the the most recent conversation of uh, uh, in, in particular, uh, Chairman Ruddick, your comments just now leave me a bit confused. It seems to me that that uh, Doug Garrison outlined that from the south end of Main Street all the way to the north end of Main Street up by Safeway is what we consider our downtown, and it is planned for development. And we have height limits to which buildings need to be designed. Somehow overlaid on those requirements and permissions, we're now saying we can't block views either. 
I think hand in hand with that go uh, Doug Garrison's comments that the, uh, the property is eligible to be developed in other ways. I can't envision much of any development that could go on on that property besides perhaps one story houses that wouldn't block some view from highway one. And even one story houses there would still take away the view from the residences on the east side of Main Street. So it, it feels to me like we're sort of endlessly talking in a circle around an area that is cited for development, planned for development, part of the downtown area, intended for development, and the proposed development is within all the guidelines except this somewhat obscure thing. Could you read that again? Cited as feasible or something like that, isn't what it says? Well, I, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I copied this correctly, but 9-23, uh, says that new development must be cited and designed to minimize intrusion into the ridgeline. So, which, which, which my understanding. I what that means. Um, well, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Doug or Winter if they want to comment. But my understanding has always been that it it allows for the the commission to use some judgment as to whether intrusion is is really been minimized. But I'd be okay. happy to hear from Doug or Winter on this. Ms. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Ruddick. Yes, I read that um, policy as you do, that it provides some discretion to make a determination uh, about the extent of the intrusion into the ridge line. Um, I think there was also anticipated to be some additional planning work. If you look at the next section there, um, about establishing um, standards to um, kind of address some of these visual resource impacts. Um, and I think that is yet to be done. So we're in a, a state right now where planning is guided by the policy that you mentioned, which does provide some leeway and discretion for um, interpretation. Does that help, Chad? It does. Uh, I'd like to speak to the bike path a little bit. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Greg Jameson pointed out the Coastal Commission, uh, which you know behaves as a guiding light in a lot of ways on these things, uh, requested that the bike path be set 20 feet from the uh, wetlands, and he's pushed it to 25 feet. There, um, I ride a bike a lot, and I can tell you where in Half Moon Bay you cannot proceed safely. With the uh, mess that's going on, excuse me, the construction that's going on itself in the Main Street right now to make the gateway, you need to pay some pretty close attention to getting down to Highway 1 at Poplar. And if you don't cross there, you take your life in your hands. Now this idea that there will be eventually a bike path of some sort along the east side of Highway 1 seems like a very good plan to me. And in this plan, there is the extension of that bike path. And fortunately, it's been designed to be outside the wetlands. Now, bike paths aren't necessarily paved roadways. This could be done with, a, with gravel or with a permeable asphalt and uh, stand back from the wetlands. Uh, Greg mentioned there'd be a fence along the, the side to keep people from driving into the area. And I like, uh, Mr. Benjamin's comments about a, a boulder or a sort of a, you know, something that says this is a special area, you don't go here. But I don't think that the bike path is a bad idea or that it goes to nowhere or that it should be left out or, or moved back to more than 100 feet from the wetlands. I think bike paths are relatively unimpactful regarding what they do to the environment and can be very impactful in terms of what you do to pedestrians if you mix them up. So. The two parallel paths, I think, is, is an excellent component of the design. And I, you know, the fact that the Coastal Commission said they wanted 20 feet, they're usually pretty conservative about what they want, in my experience. So I think this is a good design the way it sits. Um, to the comment about a signature element, my feeling about the way the, the building design and the materials and the colors and the setbacks on this project work uh, 
tells me that that is the signature element, that when you see this building and you're coming into Half Moon Bay, it, this building says to you, this is Half Moon Bay, this, this is what we are. This is, the, this is the, the, the color and the shape and the look and the, the rural component of who we are. Oh, did my computer just go dead? Can you still hear me? No, you're up, you're fine. Sorry. Okay, well, my screen just went dead. Maybe my battery's dead. I'll go get a charger. Anyway, th that's my primary remark about that signature element. Um, I think that to add some other profound, strong uh, element out there that's not part of the building is, is the statement that Now we did lose you, Chad. <laughs> <clears throat> Bummer. We lost him. <laughs> well, he'll come back when he gets his charger. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm well, thinking, not, not to de derail this, but I'm thinking we need a motion to extend beyond 1030, most likely. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. Till 11, let's say. Yes, extend till mm -hmm. 11. Bridget, I suppose we should have a roll call on that, please. Commissioner Benjamin? Yes. Commissioner Gorn? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Vice Chair Polgar? Yes. And Chair Reddick? Yes. Motion approved. Linda, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, Sorry, I, have, I maybe have been mispronouncing your surname. Do you say Poncini? In, in Italy, you say Poncini. In How do you like it? In California, you, you say Poncini. Okay. <laughs> but Poncini, Poncini. Is, is the real way. Is the real way. <laughs> when my husband's uh, grandparents immigrated, uh, they made it more Americanized, but the real way is Poncini. <laughs> Whatever you prefer. Um, <laughs> the um, I just wanted to um, agree with what Chad was saying about some kind of signature element in this project because what I like about the design is that it is it's fairly quiet, and I think that's a nice feature of it that um, it is. Um, it's clean, it's fairly contemporary, it has nice materials, but it's not really drawing attention to itself. So I might be a little concerned if, if something on the building was trying to be a signature element, whether it's a tower or some of the glass box or who knows what. Um, but I, I thought Chad made a very good point about that, um, that um, that's something to consider here. And I, I think that, um, you know, the architect and the applicant have done a good job of, of making it be fairly quiet, but still um, a very um, sophisticated building. So that was, that was my comment about that. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Committee member Kikuchi. Yes, I, uh, I I think I'm tending in the same lines as, as uh, Linda on this signature element. Uh, possibly if this building was a, a public building or a, a building that had more community significance, maybe there would be the need for more of a signature element. But this this is a uh, this is a hotel and. There are a lot of hotels in a lot of different cities that make statements that are above and beyond what they should be. And I, I think how this how this hotel is now is is nicely done. It, it doesn't shout. It's it's there. Its scale alone is going to be a statement. So I I kind of concur with the past uh, committee members. Thank you for that. Chad, I see that you're back. Where, you, did you want to continue your comment? Well, I, it was a little unclear to me what you heard and what you didn't. I, I approve of the bike path, and I think I made clear 
what I thought about that. And it sounds like the, my comments on the signature element have perhaps been echoed a bit here. Um, I do remember the, uh, to, to comment on this thing about the fire station and what uh, Jim Benjamin said about uh, noise and so on. It seems to me that during the uh, long discussions about approving that fire tower, there were a lot of conversations about uh, training noise and smoke, how infrequently they actually make smoke there. I think during the day, there can be some noise at that place, but at night, there certainly isn't. And I think it's very rare that they do nighttime training there where they make any kind of racket that would disturb the hotel guests as to, you know, engines exiting the fire station with their sirens going, that's life. That's, there's nothing anybody can do about that. Um, but I do think that you may find if you do the research that there's some uh, regulations in the permit, the permitting of the fire tower, the training tower. I was there, I can confirm. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'd just like to reiterate again that I, I do not see this parcel being vacant in another five years. Something's going to get built there. And it, it will be the first thing you see when you come into town. And it will be uh, in what we consider a downtown development area. And uh, given those factors, I think the, the design we're seeing now is not only a vast improvement over what we've seen in the past, but it's very close to being where it ought to be. I was, again, a little bit taken aback by the linearity of the whole uh, story pole configuration and how the, it, it appears as one large structure until you get just about to the middle of it and see that relatively narrow gap. And I, I don't see real easy, easy solutions to that without making long sort of glass corridors between buildings. Um, that, that design element aside, I think we're on the right page here. And uh, as far as the, uh, the judgment call that the Planning Commission is authorized to make regarding blocking foothill views, I would say this thing is as close as you're going to get to going in the right direction. That, that would be my closing comment on that. Thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vice Chair Polder. Thank you. I um, so I I'd really like to um, echo um, committee members uh, Hooker's comments just now. I, I that that really makes sense um, what he was just saying with respect to kind of what the site is in, intended for and kind of where it fits in the 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 uh, town planning. So um, I definitely agree with that and. Um, I did want to also point out a couple other things that I was really pleased to see in this design is, um, or, or discussed is that the integration of, for instance, using the laundry gray water. Um, I had, you know, written that down as an idea and I was glad, glad to hear that it's part of the, the discussion already. Um, I like how this site is already kind of the amenities and the thinking through it is, is almost geared towards the, 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 the town, you know, towards city town center, and and like, you know, that it's it. I I I actually like that it doesn't have its own, you know, fitness center or not. Fit, I, I like it actually has a fitness center, but it doesn't have its own pool, and it isn't meant to be like a let's keep everybody here on site with, uh, you know, every. I like that it, you know, there's a sense of like bike rentals and getting people to other parts of the the um, the coast and the uh, and town. Um, so I, I, I liked a lot about that. I thought that it was very thought, it, it was very thoughtfully designed and it was clear that a lot of work over the years has gone into it. So I agree with um, committee member Hooker's comments about how I think it's fairly near, nearly there. Um, I wasn't actually, I don't know if somebody maybe misunderstood understood my comments earlier. I wasn't necessarily suggesting that the that would need to be but smaller, um, more I was trying to reflect that I had heard some of the design elements that could be brought in to really get it to the, that, that um, what is it, farmhouse modern or whatever. I, I think that those are still not quite there, but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, I really ex am excited about the, the proposed housing element. It's my understanding that that would actually be part of the kind of review of this whole project, that it is part of it. 
Um, and if I have that wrong, I definitely want to be, uh, you know, staff uh, could correct me on that, but I'm understanding that that would be part of the review of it. Um, and I really am excited to see um, the, the housing um, component on north of uh, Seymour. Um, and then the only thing so that, um, and, and probably should start with this because this is, this is something that doesn't make me as happy, is that along part and parcel with this is quite a bit of parking. So one of the things I think that's going to happen, and it's just reality, I'm not sure there's a whole lot that can be done um, in terms of the design, but uh, the reality, I think what is you're going to, because of there's the parking at the south end of the, um, of the south building, the, of the hotel, that there'll definitely be now a big presence of cars right there at that end. And then there'll also be additional presence of cars right up against Highway 1 because of the expansion of the parking, which I totally understand that that's part of, you know, shifting the parking away from the parcels on the north end of Seymour or north side of Seymour to allow for housing. I think that's, I mean, you know, I, I get it. But it is a lot of, suddenly you have a lot more cars very much like parked very, uh, you know, much more visible from um, Highway 1. And one of the things that I would really hope is that there's a, a more opportunity to, or more inclusion in terms of the landscaping to shield some of that from Highway 1. Um, I would also, a suggestion is that because the eventual plan is to connect the bike, the bike um, uh, path to um, the, the, the path that'll eventually be along the, the east side path. Um, it would be great if that could be part of the plan and incorporate it through the parcels um, to the north that are part of the dealership and the housing to do that along with this project. I realize that's a big ask, but that it take, it's so, it is so hard. And um, so if there's a way to incorporate that, it may not be because it may just be that it's part of Caltrans, you know, Caltrans has the, it's their right way and they're the ones who get to dictate all that. I don't know. I'm just suggesting that um, now might be the time, particularly since if there is housing going in there to have that immediate connection to um, the bike path so that they can also use it um, directly from the housing. Granted, they could go around to Maine as well. I'm just thinking that it would be nice to get that from the start. Um, so those are some thoughts. I mean, I and I, I do want to clarify that um, I'm not it's not that I'm saying I don't want to see the parking. It's more that I just want us to acknowledge that that's, it's another trade-off. You know, I agree that there's the trade-off of like, this is a spot that I do agree is meant for development and we're going to have, you know, it's going to have some blocked views, obviously. Um, but uh, also that I do think that the parking is going to be a trade, another trade-off. Um, and the more we can do to minimize that both from the highway one, as well as it's, I think it's already addressed as far as I could see, or there, there was a recognition of a need to address it in terms of from the main street side to um, for the residents such that they aren't just faced with a wall of cars, um, that there's landscaping, et cetera, to, to minimize that. So I, I just, those are my final thoughts. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Polgar. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments about landscaping before we're done, but I'll go to Commissioner Benjamin now. Well, you may be about to make the comment I was going to make, uh, uh, Chair, because I, I was thinking um, you're right that the, you know, the walk, one of the elements that I think we want to have from Bay is the walkable character, especially in the downtown boulevard. And a, a, a small ocean of cars between the highway and development uh, is antithetical to that. So I hope that the landscaping can be designed in a way that um, softens that that perception, even if the uh, uh, the parking is shared between the um, uh, the you know the dealership uh, and the hotels. Um, I will say I I understand that there's interpretation with respect to what minimizing um, uh, intrusion uh, through the ridge line is. Uh, I respect that. Um, you know, I, I think for whatever else you can say, I've been consistent with Poplar. I didn't like it with Magnolia. I didn't like it. Why should I like it now? Um, so it's a respectful disagreement and I, I think we've aired it. I appreciate your listening, uh, to that point of view. Um, I think that as we, you know, related to, uh, how we make this work in scale for walkable scale versus the number of cars that would be on the site. 
um, the circulation aspects are going to be really interesting to watch. And hopefully there can be something in the way uh, the, the circulation runs that reinforces the idea that this is a pedestrian bike friendly town. I do worry about that a bit just from the sheer scale of the development. So thanks for, thanks for giving me that, that fast word. Of course. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify. Um, first of all, I agree with everything that Sarah just said, 100%, um, just, just, just to put it out there. But I'm not looking for an obnoxious signature element that says we're Reno or Las Vegas. That's, that's not the intention. It's, I heard my colleagues say, this isn't, you know, a uh, farmhouse modern. There's something lacking in this. It lacks that little bit of character. It can be subtle, it can be sophisticated, it can be whatever you want, but it's lacking right now. And 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 that is, it's it could be tiny. I don't I don't know. And it doesn't have to be a structure, but it's just that that's the the key thing is that there's just a little element missing here that sends the signal that this is a transition. And and that that's that's what I'm looking for. It's not it's not welcome to Las Vegas sign. Understood. Understood. My um, I know that the the landscaping plan is certainly a work in progress, but I'd I'd like to offer a couple of of uh, uh, points to staff and the applicant as they develop that. I. I think it's a great opportunity to create a landscaping plan for this two acres of open space, but it needs to be very carefully done, uh, partly because of the wetlands that, that are, are so close there, and also because uh, we have a policy 9-13 that requires the, the developer to permanently maintain the frontage landscaping. So it's something that we'll be stuck with for a very long time. I also would like to, I, I hope and trust that the two mature cypress trees that are uh, to, at the north end of that uh, property would be protected. And obviously as, as uh, Vice Chair Polgar and others have commented, there's a real opportunity and a need for creative uh, shielding via street trees and other approaches uh, along Main Street and between the hotel and the and the new parking lot, and to some extent, the wetlands allowing on the on the west side of that parcel. So that's all I had on that. Um, Rick, you have your hand up again, I think. No. Okay. Mr. Jameson has his hand up, and I, I've been told would like to comment on some of the issues that we've raised. So I'll. Uh, I don't have to open the public hearing to have the applicant talk, do I? Um, through the chair, we sometimes do that in regular public meetings um, because applicant is um, usually treated as part of the public, but this is a study session. So I think it's up to your good judgment there. Well, thank you, Winter. Uh, go ahead, Greg, please. Okay, yes. Well, you, you guys, uh, I appreciate the comments. A lot of them. I wrote down a lot of notes, and uh, I did want to get a couple clarifications and ask a couple questions because if, if we're going to move forward with some of these design elements that you'd like to see, um, I you know I just need to know which way to go with that. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the buildings themselves. You know, we looked hard at creating all these separate buildings and. There's issues with uh, another set of elevators, uh, two more sets of staircases and security of tying it all together. And then it's spreading it out. Um, it was difficult to do to fit on the site. So, you know, we ended up going smaller like we did. Um, but I have an idea and I, I'm gonna put this out there and see what your thoughts are. We can create more separation between the two buildings. But if we were able to shift the South building um, straight south in a straight line, doesn't shift with the parking at all, but if we can move it straight south, whatever distance, 20, 25 feet, we can add that between the buildings. We're at 16 feet now, we can go to 35 feet, whatever you like, but it will encroach partially into right past the 100 foot buffer. 
and it would be in that area, but you know, it's a trade-off of, I mean, I'm already, you know, being, uh, you know, potentially uh, in the Coastal Commission, I am in the Coastal Commission's jurisdiction. It's my understanding we can go down as low as 50 feet um, as far as a setback um, from wetlands, uh, both I believe in the city code and also Coastal Commission. I've read different materials. I may not be accurate, but there's an area we can give. I don't, I'd have no problem shifting it. And, you know, I would shift it to the north, but again, I was trying to accomplish creating the housing and the affordable elements. So, you know, I was bringing parking on the north portion of it. So, you know, it's a small puzzle and there's a lot of pieces and I'm having a hard time really moving it around. I, I'd be glad to make some shifts. If you can give me an opinion, I don't need it right quick because I got a couple more things, but if you can give me an opinion on that item, that's something we'd be you know, glad to do. And, and you know, there's other elements you may want to change as well, but I, if I can shift that building a little further south, it, it could solve a lot of these problems. Um, let's see here. As far as the bike path goes, um, you know, we were offering that as something I thought the city would want, and it's, you know, at our cost to put it in, because I, you know, I've participated in enough meetings over the years, and I realized we were going to have an east parallel trail. We don't have to put that bike path in if you'd prefer it not to be there. Um, that's up to you. I, I just was offering it because I thought it was a, a good solution to, to preserve those wetlands and not have to try to deal with it down the road when the path goes in and have to go straight through them. So, you know, I'm open to whatever you think's best on that. Um, a question about the Coastside Theater. I've spoken with the, uh, the people that, uh, one of the fellows that runs that, he would be very excited for this project. And just to share that with you. I know that was a question Jimmy had. Um, the, there will be trees protecting the parking area on the south end. That's their every intent to do that. It'll wrap around that so you don't see the parking. I'm trying to think what other questions you guys had on here. But the main thing for me is, oh, and the other thing is, is if I was to build, you know, there's no question, Jimmy, you're, you're right. If you stand on the path, the bike path and look straight east, there's no question we cross the ridge line. I've, I've got story pole pictures I didn't get to present tonight that I would like to even still if you want to see them, but the straight view straight from west to east, you're blocked. But if you stand at the south new intersection, and I used um, key markers, so that, like benchmarks, so you knew I wasn't fooling with the, the pictures, there's, it's, it's almost completely nothing at the south end. And from the north looking south, same difference. It's, it's only when you're on the path looking straight east. So, it, you know, if that's going to blow the deal up, there's nothing I can do. I just can't get it down low enough. I, I've did a cross section. I can stand on Highway 1 and look at a single family home, most likely the single family because I pushed the hotel, hotel so far east, but a two story home definitely blocks more views than, uh, you know, housing does than the hotel itself because I've shifted the hotel so far to the east. It, it used to be as close as 38 feet. And now it's, you know, basically 90 feet plus. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to make it right and make it work and make it feasible. I think it's a good project for the city. I think there's a lot of benefits to everybody. Um, but if you could give me some clarification, you know, mainly on the building, and if you would be allow or would be interested in making that shift, I can, I can do what you like as far as creating more space between those two structures. Well, thank you, Greg. I, I'm sure we can give you some feedback. You know, the, the study session tonight, the, uh, the Planning Commission and the AAC are not required or expected to reach a consensus. So you, so you, may, you may hear a couple of different opinions, but um, I, I think Commissioner Hernandez had his hand up first. Yeah, so um, I'm loath to do design work from the dais. Um, it, it can be very problematic. So, but you asked for feedback. So when you made the comment, the thing that occurred to me is you currently have a gap between the two buildings, which could be used for interesting space, but it's not quite big enough to do anything truly interesting. Combining the patio with that empty space would allow you to accomplish two things. One, you have a bigger usable patio area. And if you want to do a movie theater, or if you want to do something else with that space, you've now got the the third leg of the stool that 
uh, member Ponsini was talking about, it, it could create that for you. And it doesn't, doesn't dramatically change the project, but it might help with the, the, the aesthetic. Can you hear Thank me? Thank you for that. Uh, committee member Hooker. Yeah, um, perhaps uh, uh, Doug or perhaps Jim, since he's mentioned this several times, could give some clarity on this, this comment that Greg made about the required setback from the wetlands, because I, I think that goes directly to the heart of this idea of shifting one building, the south building south. It's not clear to me that if, if it's 50 feet or 100 feet or where we got the 100 foot number, is that really the city code? What's the deal? Move the chair. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin. Yeah, it's policy 6-41, um, uh, Greg and Chad. Uh, the buffer uh, has, there are very specific requirements. 100 feet is the minimum. It can be reduced only when some very difficult to satisfy conditions can be fulfilled. And, um, you know, I, it would be basically like saying, the only, you know, if this were a home, and of course it's not, we'd be saying, you know, I want to build this particular home, and the only way I can do it is if I encroach into that buffer. And if uh, staff were to say, well, could you build a different home that didn't encroach, and, and the applicant said, no, I can't do that, so we need to encroach. So we wouldn't accept that for a home, and I don't think we would want to do that here. Um, so I, you know, my sense with respect to the buffer zone is um, we'd really be having to open the door to making the argument that there's not another feasible design and you've got one here that, that achieves an awful lot and respects the 100 foot buffer. So I think it would be a pretty tall, pretty steep path to climb. Um, with respect to uh, the uh, intrusion into the uh, ridge line. I think you know we've read the policy. We see that it's about minimizing. To be fair, it does not say avoid or shall not intrude. So there's room for interpretation, I think, as our city attorney has advised. Um, with respect to massing, I, it would be a stretch to make the trade-off that, that improving massing would get us where we want to go enough to uh, encroach on the buffer. But that's obviously a judgment call that you guys would want to weigh on. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Benjamin. Uh, Mr. Garrison. Um, I, I generally, I think, concur with what Commissioner Benjamin said. Um, the rules as far as encroaching on wetlands, I think are more in the shall not kind of realm than as we've discussed, um, the visual resources with hills, it's, it's a little more flexible. You also have to remember, we have different policies on visual resources that say different things. So the area within 200 yards of Highway 1 is also considered a visual resource. Um, so on the one hand, you minimize the impacts right next to Highway 1 with all that open space, but as we said, there's a little bit of trade-off with the hill views. So that I think is where there's more flexibility than moving the building into the wetland buffer. I mean, we can, after the meeting, get together and, you know, with the city attorney and kind of go through that. But that's my take on it, that it's probably not a real feasible approach to move the building into the buffer. Yeah, for for what it's worth, my personal opinion, as I, I said a little while ago, is I, I I wouldn't be in favor of that trade off to move into the buffer and lose uh, that nice open space you've got for, to gain the benefits of the of the effect on massing. But as I warned you, Greg, you may not get a strong consensus <laughs> from from this big group. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin. I'm sorry, I should have lowered my hand. Okay. I was gonna to speak to the question that uh, that Chad had raised and I think I have. So thank you for asking. 
Uh-huh. Doug, from your point of view, is there any additional feedback or commentary you'd like from the AAC and the Planning Commission? Um, no, I, I'm feeling like it was actually quite a productive meeting. Uh, you're right, we do get some differences of opinions and that's fine. That's for staff to sort of go through all this um, post meeting and we'll sort of triage all the comments and then look at what the path through that is. Um, there were some, some areas where everybody did seem to agree and I, I think that's helpful. Uh, points us in the right direction on this. Um, so I, I think we're in good shape on the staff level here. I'm glad to hear that. Did one more opportunity to ask if uh, any uh, Vice Chair Polgar, please. Um, I just wanted to to clarify that the 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 demarcation of the the wetlands that you have in this it, that's based on a, a wetlands delineation, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Do committee members or commissioners have any further comments you'd like to make? <clears throat> uh, through the chair, I just want to thank Greg for his patience through this process. I don't know if uh, Commissioner Hernandez was referring to me as the other person, but I remember watching iterations of his plan from more than a decade ago. And um, it's uh, it's quite an opus to have gotten to this point. And uh, at times it must feel thankless, but uh, I appreciate the fact that he's hearing from the public and continuing to iterate his design. And um, it was, uh, this is one of those study sessions that feels like it was worth having. Yeah, I, I, I echo Commissioner Benjamin's uh, sentiments. Um, I, I've tried to follow my own uh, advice and stick to evaluating the design and siting versus the policy. So I'm not gonna mention things like creation of affordable housing and creation of jobs and positive impact on the city's transient occupancy tax, but thank you and you and you and your team, uh, Greg, for, for being so patient and positive tonight. Uh, Linda, did you want to speak? Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Commissioner Hernandez for um, the clarification and comment on how to make uh, this project a little more special. Um, and not having to do some big element, but uh, probably a sensitivity to detailing. And as somebody's walking around the building or through the area, that there will be special elements of it. They could be very small. They can be very um, uh, artistic pieces that add to the quality of the building and the experience. And I think that was really a good point so that the applicant doesn't feel like they have to do a big, huge thing uh, or some major architectural change to their approach. I think the approach is very good. And I, I think that was a, uh, a nuance that is important so that when it comes to the AAC, we can look at that. What are the things that make this special? And so I really wanted to thank Commissioner Hernandez for that. That was all. Well said, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I feel like this concludes our deliberation as part of this special study uh, session. It's a pleasure to meet with the, to, and work with the AAC members. Thank you all. Uh, Doug, will, will there be a director's report tonight? If there is, it will be very brief. <laughs> well, you, well, you'd be the one to say. <laughs> I think you just one. heard it. <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to uh, get one done in under 30 seconds for you here. Fabulous. Uh, I, I think the main thing I just want to let you know is that we anticipate that um, Gil Ekas will be back um, probably mid-July um, 
So you will be in better hands going forward. Um, as far as she has much better knowledge of projects and ordinances that are being coming before you in the future. Um, so I'm not really gonna delve into that. Um, I think Jill can get everybody up to date when she comes back. We, we, we do have, just to chime in, we do have a planning commission meeting scheduled for July 13th. Um, the, the Poplar plan that Brittany's project will be um, mm. by the main topic that evening and John Dowdy will be helping um, staff that meeting as well. So that's kind of the upcoming. Um, and then there will be an AAC meeting um, in person July 15th. So the topics of that meeting are still um, being worked out um, for that AAC meeting, but it's kind of where we're at. Which poplar plan, the beach or the gate or the, um, path. the street? The path from, uh, from Railroad Avenue to the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I expect that um, winter can, will Can arrive. we clarify, sorry, that this is the, the path from, I didn't okay. hear that. Between Railroad and the Coastal Trail, the bike head path that runs parallel to Poplar Street. Oh, okay, okay. That will be July 13th, along with the garden apothecary item from Scott Phillips. Yes, and those of us who live close to the Poplar Path will welcome guidance from winter <laughs> prior to that meeting. <laughs> Yes, and it's also going to be a good segue for your upcoming um, Coastside Land Trust Trail Extension project. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do any commissioners or AAC members have communications to share? Well, I would entertain a meeting, a motion to adjourn in that case. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Commissioner Benjamin has seconded it using universal sign language. Bridget, if you'll call the roll, please. Commissioner Benjamin? Yes. Commissioner Gorn? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Vice Chair Polgar? Yes. And Chair Ruddick? Yes. Motion approved. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks all.